Yanis Fitcher will be owing us a pit stop. Well, in, in 20 minutes' time, but uh, Nicky Katzberg lapping way far. In fact, so much faster that he's actually just set his fastest lap of the race, the BMW wow. 98 in. He was very quick when he came out of the pits, having taken over from Nick Yellowly, and clearly liking what he's finding out there, the track conditions. Yeah, there's debris on the outside of the circuit, but the track temperature cooling down now. Knight still saying, actually, no, fairly stable, 19 degrees as it was before, but a 2 minute 18.2 second lap, that is a quickie. And that is why he's uh, stretching clear of the sister car, which has Max S on board now, four seconds between them. And what a variety of racing he is doing. Two weekends ago, Corvette racing in IMSA. Last weekend, ETCR for Hyundai. This weekend, racing at the Spa 24 Hours for BMW. Just can't help himself, really. Well, and last weekend, actually, had a really big weekend. It's only his third weekend in the electric touring cars, which are a very odd beast, um, and was within, le I'm going to say, 400 metres of winning the super final in his group and had a puncture okay. on the last lap, one corner from home. Martin, explain ETCR. ETCR. In a nutshell. Uh, TCR touring cars, so sort of family hatchbacks, in his case a Hyundai Veloster, um, with electric power and rear wheel drive. They weigh, because the battery packs, they weigh around 1,900 kilos, so big heavy cars, on treaded all-weather tyres, and they produce 500 kilowatts. 500 kilowatts in old money is 670 brake horsepower, so they are the most powerful touring cars ever built. So wow. it's, it's basically the weight of a Range Rover with 700. So it is an Aston Martin DBX 707, basically, on treaded tyres, being driven by nutters with rear wheel drive only. They are go. insanely fast. In fact, some of the drivers, frankly, when you get them onto the full 500 kilowatts, quite frightening. Um, they're, they're a big old beast, so yeah, he's developing well to that. Right. So meanwhile, our race leader, Jana Fitcher, what a good time he is having. Yes, Nicky Katzberg is lapping quicker, but he's on brand new tyres that are only two laps old, and Jana is on tyres that are a stint old. Right, just, uh, just let's go down through the classes. So we've got Yanis Fitcher leading the Silver Cup, leading the race. However, he will be in the pits, and that will put the two BMWs back yep. into the lead. In the Gold Cup class, 16th overall, really impressive run for the Hout Racing team. It's looking pretty rock solid in that class. It's a uh, good run from Hubert Howe, but Indian racer Arjun Maini leading that. Yep. Uh, only a lap down, that's impressive. Leading car in Pro-Am, Alessio Picariello working his way he came into the bottom of the front, type, front page of the timing screen. That's 35th position. He's now up to 24th position, rather fitting. He's in car number 24 and uh, having a really rock solid run. Quite a long way clear of Stefano Costantini, who is second in the class. Bronze lead, as you can see in the screen, is the Falcon Horse Motorsport car, Donald Yount, currently at the wheel. They're in 35th place overall, so just gone off. Uh, According to our timing screen, they have 35th. Either that or he's not driving it. 44th. Yeah. Car number 35, from Walken Horse Motorsport. Oh, sorry, yeah, car number 35, first in, in the bronze class. And. With George Kurtz uh, a lap further back, and George is uh, yeah. driving car number 20, which is the SPS Automotive. It's the black and, and silver uh, Mercedes in class, sharing that with Valentin Pierberg, Tim Muller, and Rima Jafali. And George's company, CrowdStrike, will be the event sponsor next yeah. year. So yep. he's he's into the Spa 24s in a big way. Yes. So great to have, I must say, in recent years, so many people crossing the Atlantic to race. We've got a lot of Canadian races, but even more American races, just yep. enjoying this great race. And again, that is a, an entity of the spread of GT3. And of course, GT World Challenge America is growing and uh, racing some yep. great circuits. And it's only right they come across and play over here. And, and the great deal about GT3 is that it's the same wherever you are in the world. So if you have GT3 experience, that translates into the same kind of cars in a different championship. And so it's, it, 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 yeah. you have the ability 
to go and race anywhere and not be in totally alien machinery. In fact, just the opposite. You can be in extraordinarily familiar mach machinery. Slightly different team members, potentially, but and slightly different, you know, co-drivers. But it means that you know the car and you know your limits in the car. And that's, you know, for a gentleman driver who's got that ability, it's really, really important to, to be able to translate your knowledge into something that, that that, that you can relate to. So, Yanis Fischer, car number four, the overall race leader and leading the Silver Cup. So for the Hout Racing team, they're leading the Silver Cup, they're leading the Gold Cup, but they're leading the race, yeah. that is the thing. But of course, it will <laughs> yes. readjust. In fi within 15 minutes, well, about four, 13 minutes now, Yanis Fitcher will have to call into the pit lane, so he doesn't exceed his 65 minutes. What won't lane. happen, though, is that he won't drop off the lead lap. He will be, at the very minimum, back down to 12th place, which is the last car on the lead lap. So even if everybody else, although we're now sort of, where are we? We're nearly 45 minutes out from the safety car restart. Um, you know, we, he will probably still be in the top 10. And again, we'll continue to cycle up and down as those pit stops unfold. So it's entirely possible that by the time he's getting towards, or that car's getting towards the end of its next stinks, I don't think he's necessarily going to stay in, that they may well have cycled back to the top of the pile again. And, and again, it's n the fact that he's in a different class doesn't affect the speed of the car inherently. The car potentially has the same speed. So if it's got a quick peddler in it, it'll still be quick. No, exactly so. However, his lap time at the moment, <laughs> he's lapping about two seconds off the pace yep. of, per lap of the chasing BMW. So even if they carry on cycling through in this order, running sort of 45 minutes apart in terms of when they have to come and visit the pits, yep. in time, Janas Fitch's car will drop down the order. Shared with Frank Bird, British racer, Jordan Love, the Australian, and Swiss racer Alain Valent. So it's in a fantastic position, and it's way, way clear yeah. in the Silver Cup class. But in the course, over the course of time, it will drop down the order. And actually, he's lapping about a second a lap or so. And it, of course, he's in clear air quicker than anybody else in his class. Not only is he a lap ahead of them, but he's also lapping quicker than anybody else in the class. So, you know, he's he's losing ground overall to the pro drivers who are chasing him down, but he is creeping away and adding to the advantage over the class rivals. And what that does is it just allows you all to relax a little bit. Having a lap in hand, you know if something goes pear-shaped is nothing. It's two minutes, it's nothing. If you pick up a puncture, you'll lose that lap before you get back to the pit lane, but it allows you just to breathe a little bit. Now, he's in the position where he's not in a lot of traffic, but if you were, if you were down in the 20s or whatever, when we restarted and you are constantly in traffic, with you trying to pass people and people trying to pass you, having that lap in hand means you don't have to go for every fractional opportunity. You can just breathe a little and just flow. And being out front just gives him the, I mean, look, we're with Nicky Katzberg, you can't even see his red lights. He's 20 seconds up the road. Yep. Yeah, Janis Fitcher is driving around Spa absolutely on his own. There is no one else in his world right now. I mean, this is the greatest chance to have a, a track day, stroke track night, at Spa that he will ever have. Yeah, no, and the gap is coming down. It's under 20 seconds now, and uh, two to three seconds per lap is the gain for Nicky Katzberg. Nicky yeah. Katzberg, of course, is in a pro, pro, pro driver lineup. He's actually dropping the sister car with Max Hess, uh, second a lap at the moment so that gap is going out towards seven seconds between second and third overall Danny Junker Dea is trying his best but he's another six and a bit seconds back in fourth place in the 88 Mercedes from a Cody SP well, on the last lap alone Nicky Katzberg was by between six tenths and eight tenths the fastest man in the top 20 well he's been like lightning since yeah. he took over yeah from Nick Cololi. I mean, on his outlap, he started banging in green sector times. He's the fastest absolutely for that car. feeling no pain right now. His his career is just going weller than than anybody has a right to expect. You talk about a purple patch. Nicky Katzberg is having one this season. He's just having a really, really stellar time. Alessandro Bartzan comes into AF Corsa, followed by the 52 car. Now, these cars stopped same time, same back channel last time round. 
52. Stefano Costantini, who's running second in the pro yep. class, should stay. He's got a sufficient margin over Enrique Chavez in the remaining garage, 59 McLaren. That's number car number 188. But it's still Alessio Picariello leading the pro -Am class comfortably. But the sister motorsport. AF Corsa car, the 21 car, is the problem child. That car is basically last on the road. It is clinging on. Not quite last on the road. We've got Alex Ribeiro still trying to make up ground in the heart of racing team. Uh, Aston Martin, and they just tweeted a while ago and said, actually, the, oh, at right. least the view's good from here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're still going, but their problem was really on. Yeah. They've been running perfectly since then, so they will just keep going. In fact, they've just had a pit stop for yes. uh, Alex Riveras, but, uh, you know, great to have another team coming across from the States to come and play here. Back again with our race, uh, the man who will be our race leader, Nicky Katzberg, in probably uh, five, or, well, seven or eight minutes, another couple of laps. Uh, the two Rover racing cars will come back to the top of the pile. And again, the team will be saying to him, fine, you're the leader. Just, yeah, no, but am I? Yes, you're the leader. It doesn't match about the other car. You're catching him. You're the quickest car on track. You've been the quickest car on track since you got into the car. Just keep on doing the do. Uh, and, you know, this is the beginning of undoubtedly a double and, and possibly a triple for Nicky. So, you know, this is, we talked about, the 88 Mercedes and, it, and, and that big stint to pull away from the field. Well, Nicky is doing that now in the 98. That This is possibly a, a triple that will make the race for them. Of course, you know, all sorts of other things can come in. Um, and he's just started to catch the very first bit of traffic. So didn't quite see who that was, but it's, it's the first bit of traffic he's had since the red flag. Well, the first the car I think he saw, I think it was Janis Fitcher because he was 14 seconds down on him. He's now 10.8 seconds. That, it, that is the yeah. length of the, the start finish straight. But we saw that before when Marcello yeah. was pulling clear. Got, once he got to a dozen seconds clear, he was turning around the source before the others came around the final part of the bus But stop. he just passed somebody on the run up through Blanchiment. There are all the blue lights by the... Uh, by the uh, bridge again, and and there is traffic ahead. So now he's starting to get. Oh, no, that's someone that's coming somebody out of the pit. Somebody coming exit. out of the pit. So that will be, uh, yeah, 36 car. That, it could be the Aston Martin. Uh, oh, no, you're Alex right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is Alex Riveras. There you go, past the Aston. So he's on pit out. There are only a couple of cars in the pit lane at the moment. And again, when the car comes out of the pit lane, it's building up to speed up the Camel Straight. So it's easy meet for somebody who is fully up to speed. Our race leader is Nicky Katzberg, and that means his teammate Nick Yellerly is in the pit lane, and Gemma Scott has pounced. Nick, you've just come in from your stint. Car's feeling good, you said. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we've been tuning it over, uh, over the stints, uh, and now into the night. Our car tends to come alive, and it has, um, so... Yeah, felt, felt pretty nice. I need some sleep now. I haven't had much, so uh, Nicky's in the car for, I think, a couple of hours, then Augusto, so uh, yeah, I'll finally have the chance to get a couple of hours too. Still a long way to go. It feels kind of surreal with the later finish than we're used to. Yeah, exactly. We were just talking, and it's not even halfway through yet, so uh, yeah, main, main targets are stay out of trouble and uh, yeah, just keep plugging away. With the full course yellow and safety car rules this year, you always get brought back into contention or reeled back in. So um, it doesn't always matter if you can pull a big gap or not. So yeah, just trying to keep clean and uh, thankfully the car's working very, very well. It'll be interesting to see the percentage of time we've spent under full course yellow because it seems to be quite a lot. Yep. How are you keeping out of trouble? How tough is it with the track limits and the new rules? Yeah, the track limits and then obviously you have the different classes. And then if you've been on a night stint before and someone comes fresh out of the pits, then they're just learning and trying to find their feet. So, yeah, it's very, very difficult to choose your battles out there. Um, but, yeah, just got to try and be patient, which is pretty hard for us racing drivers. Now go get some rest. Thanks a lot, Nick. See you later. Patience is a virtue, isn't it? And, and, and in, a, in a racing car especially, and especially, again, we'll come back to this, with all of those gravel traps that, that are now all the way around the circuit that actually enforces the need for patience because uh, a mistimed lunge you're out of the race yeah, and you might think it's covered by the darkness it isn't yeah. we're looking we're watching but the good news is for Nicky Katzberg at the moment and for of course Nick Yulelli who's just uh, handed over to him is it's just every lap is a gain for them in the effective lead of the race Yanis Fitcher will be into the pits within 
uh, the next three to four minutes. Rear Chiro Tomita in sort of walls early one, that 33 Audi dropping way, way down the order, but it's uh, kept on going. Now rising right. almost to 38th well, no, no, position, no. best they, position it's been in for a while. They've got a drama is that he can't get the car to start. They're going, go, 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 go. Now he's got it fired at me, but he was kind of, what, 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 what is not working? And, and maybe it's a little idiosyncrasy of that particular team's car, but uh, you would think that probably shouldn't be. Janis Fitcher, our race leader for the Haupt Racing Team. Stop the count, freeze the result now. 12 hours and 24 minutes to go. Um, but for this team, yeah, comfortably leading their category. OK, so what happens in, in 24 minutes? We get to the halfway point in yeah. the race, and at that point, Janis Fitcher would have pitted from the lead because he's yes. going to make a pit stop in the next three minutes, which puts those two BMWs back into the lead to take yes. the maximum haul of 12 points and nine points for first and second in the race. They will help bring Rover Racers' championship challenge on very nicely yeah. indeed. Absolutely. And then half the race will be done and the other half will still to go, by which time... It will be getting light. The sky will be lightning. But when dawn comes, instead of being about eight hours left to go or, or 10 hours left to go, there was to be 12 hours left to go. Interesting speed at uh, Nick Yololi and Rob Bell. BMW and uh, McLaren sharing the fastest time the, through the speed trap at Eau Rouge. Race vision powered by AWS, great graphic there. And Lawrence Van Tour, not exactly too shabby, just a kilometer an hour slower. And Dan Harper in the second of the BMWs, just tucked in behind. And Marco Sorensen in the Aston Martin. You know what, you'll find all those cars within the top, in fact, nine positions yeah. in the race. So that, those statistics tell a story as well. And of course, that is the speed into Eau Rouge, which sort of rears up in front of you like some sort of tarmac tsunami coming towards you and especially with the grandstand now it's just this most enormous monumental edifice in front of you it just keeps going up and up and up and up and up it's like you're heading into the front of a massive yeah. wave it's like they've gone to that huge one off portugal and at nazare it's about 100 feet high but as well you just saw 266 267 at the top of the hill so that's north of 160 miles an hour it's about 162 163 that's the the top speed as they get onto the brakes at Le Combe. So, yeah, I mean, very impressive speed with that launch downhill from La Source into Eau Rouge. And that's why the ironing out of the bump in the, dip, in the compression has made such a difference because the car's not fighting you so much. It's now actually drivable through there, raceable through there. Lead is in. Janis Fitcher into the lead, into the pit lane rather, from the lead. And expect Dries Van Tour and Marco Mapelli from 13th and 14th positions. The 32 Audi and the 6 Lamborghini to come in. They are a lap down, however, but they are chipping away. With a bit of luck, they may get back onto the lead lap. In fact, both Haupt Racing Team cars are in, because Arjun Maini is in, in the number 5 car that leads the gold class. And from 19th position, Stuart White in. Yep in the number 14 Emil Fry Racing Lamborghini. So it's just starting to get a little bit busy again. However, for Nicky Katzberg and Max Hess running first and second for Rover Racing, they do not need to come in for another 40 minutes or yeah. thereabouts. Lucas Legere in as well. Chris Frogger in in the uh, Sky Mercedes. So Marcus Finkelhock in a game. That's the 15th stop for that car. Who else has made 15 stops? Uh, well, the number five Halp Racing team have, but most have done 11 or possibly 12. So beyond that, then you're looking at cars that have had a, a drama. Jordan Love having a bit of a weave in the silver class leading number four car. So he has just taken over um, from Janis Fitcher, so Jordan Love at the wheel of the car as he's on his outlap. And that car will drop down to maybe ninth or tenth place, but again, such a solid run. Okay, here we go. We're starting to get into it now where the body of our front runners are coming in. This is the 32 uh, Rothko car. This, I beg your pardon, the silver car of uh, JB Simonauer. So that car currently third in the Silver Cup. Interesting thing for me 
at the moment, Martin, is the gap between first and second between Nicky Katzberg and his own teammate, Max Hess, just went yeah. out by another second. It's now 12 and a bit seconds. That has really grown quite comprehensively in the past half yeah. dozen laps. And Danny Junkadea in third, closing very slowly on the number 50 Rover Racing BMW, but not closing at all on Nicky Katzberg. So uh, Maximilian Hess is, is sort of just dropping away from the leader and vaguely towards the clutches and third place car. But I don't think that Junkadea is going to catch him 16 seconds in this stint. Uh, and. Ah, oh, beg your pardon, no, he's no, three he's seconds three, behind, yeah, yeah, no, he, he, he's, he's behind leader. So he's taking three seconds behind Max Hesse, and he's got Antonio Fuoco three seconds behind him. Six seconds behind him is Maxime Martin in fifth, and Maxime Martin is leading a very tight gaggle. Maxime Martin, Dennis Olsen, Matt Campbell, and Marvin Kirchhofer are covered by about a second and three quarters. So when those four cars pit together as they will, there could be place changes in the pit lane, depending on whether or not there's a driver change and also on whether or not the teams are too tired uh, to handle it. Nicky Kasberg comes around the corner. Somebody just stopped, a couple of cars stopped in front of him. Pachi Kujala and Sven Muller. Uh, not sure if that was them. Jens Klingman is in as well. Philip Ellis in the 75 Mercedes. So yeah, three or four cars are in. And just looking at the front end of the field, of course, uh, Danny Junkadea in third place, the 88 Mercedes ASP Mercedes, is going to have to make its pit stop about five to six minutes before, so therefore two laps before Max Hess. So even though he's gaining all the time, he's down to just 2.7 yeah. seconds in the rear. So in fact, another good lap for him. He gained another half second as he closes in. It'll be frustrating. He'll probably just about get onto the tail of those car of uh, Max Hess's car. No, in fact, at this rate, he might get there rather sooner. So I was thinking he'd get just the point he, he could possibly pass it and he'll have to serve his pit stop. We'll see. It may happen sooner than that. Uh, official air temperature 18.2. According to the big thermometer on the old uh, race control tower, 15 degrees. And I have to say, it feels more, it felt more like that earlier on than um, we haven't been outside for six hours, but it did feel like it was mid teens rather than low 20s. So. Okay. But well, let's hear one of the drivers who's going towards the front end of the field. He's up to sixth place. It's Lawrence Van Tor. I'm with Dries Van Tor, and I've just said to him that was a tough stint, and your reply was it's a tough weekend. Yeah, well, uh, it's not really going our way at already all weekend, but uh, we're just got trying to keep on and uh, keep fighting. I think we gained the lap back. Uh, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, just uh, trying to survive, basically. We're not quite halfway through yet, Dries. Is there something you can do to turn this around still? Stay alive and uh, see uh, see if others, what others can do. But for us, uh, it's difficult. I mean, uh, especially in traffic. Uh, now in the night, it's a bit better as well with track limits. But uh, other than that, it's also a complete joke. Um, but yeah, like I said, we're just trying to survive, uh, do our laps, and maybe to, uh, by tomorrow lunchtime, we will be somewhere where we would like to be. But uh, we have to keep pushing. The tire issues early on didn't help, right? Uh, no, and uh, we just have to try to really be safe on them um, and uh, make sure we don't do any track limits. Thanks, Trace. It's a difficult position to be in. You don't feel you've got the performance. You yeah. don't, you, you're not in a position where you can take any risks. You're a lap down, and that, that is... That is Dries Van Tool with his shoulders on the floor. Everybody it's comes Everybody comes to win, don't they? They come dog. to win either their class or to try and win outright. And when you get kicked in the teeth early on, it's very hard to be bouncy and excited and, and everything else. And, yeah, you're right. You know, his, his head is down, his tail is down, and he's just... And actually, you know, sometimes... Races aren't fun. Sometimes you just have to grind it out, and, and that's where they find themselves. Nicky Katzberg, on the other hand, feeling very little pain right now, I'm thinking. Very little pain. Frankly, right now, he's probably thinking, can I go on for a quadruple stint? Yeah. He's absolutely loving it. But for Dries Van Tor, he, you know, the family's got such success in this race, but he, though he's won 24-hour races, he hasn't won Belgium, therefore his own 24-hour yeah. race. He's had great results, and particularly with Charles Wirtz, across the course of seasons, they've been super successful the last couple of years. Still both very young indeed, but um, you just feel the pressure starting to come onto Dries. And at the start of this year, he thought he had a, a 
an Audi LMH programme lined up for him, and then, of course, it was uh, pulled. And it's quite <laughs> difficult when other people have aligned with other, other manufacturers. Yeah. They've got lucky, and yeah. you... It looked as though it was cast in guild. And now we know, of course, Audi are looking at Formula One, and it, you know it's it's suddenly you know the landscape has changed. And I really do feel for for Dries and Charles. You Charmiers. do, you do, but he's not the only man who no, of course uh, he is. who who had the, the rug pulled out from under him. There's an awful lot of people in the Audi team who had the rug pulled out from under them as well. So, you know, and the car was testing and and was you know was due to be you know ahead of the curve compared to Porsche, who may well race before the end of the season and could probably do with racing before the end of the season. Um, car number five, Arjun Maini, remained in the gold class, leading uh, second place in gold class, uh, helped uh, Mercedes, and that's under investigation for speeding in the pit lane, which means they were speeding in the pit lane. The yeah. under investigation bit means we're just going to produce the evidence and then ping. Uh, so that will have to serve a penalty at its next pit stop. Um, and there are, uh, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, no, five uh, track limit violations, um, which earn you extra time in the pits as a bonus for not paying attention to where the uh, the, <laughs> the, the uh, racetrack has painted its white lines. Right. So Danny Juncker there now 1.4 seconds down in third place. He's catching Max Hess. Max Hess is falling away from race leader. His own teammate, Nicky Katzberg, who's leading in the 98 Rover Racing BMW Max, is now 14 and a half seconds in arrears. So 15, 16 seconds covers the top three. But unfortunately for Max Hess, he was the meat in the sandwich. But it's uh, going back towards the Danny Juncker there, number 88, Acodis ASP Mercedes, who's got a sizable margin over fourth place, which is the Antonio Fuoco-driven yellow Iron Lynx racing yeah. car. That's 20 seconds back. That's quite spread out, but second to third is closing in, and it's 1.4 seconds at the start of this lap, and at every interval, it's coming down a little bit. In fact, as I say, that actually yeah, a better first yeah. stint for Max Hess around this lap. Well, here's the view from third, Danny Junkadea, and there's the lights in front of second. So that's the gap. And, and that's you know, let's say you're Nicky Katzberg, you've got the track to yourself, you just drive as fast as you like. But if you're in a chase and you don't have visual contact with the car in front, that visibility, that view that you can see him there is just an extra little spur. It doesn't distract the driver, but it just acts as a further incentive. Once he's in sight or she's in sight, then there's that extra little bit of of effort somehow that it's impetus isn't it well i think it's just a mental thing I, th I think you just feel it's more achievable and every time you get to the same corner on a lap you're a little nearer and it's that constant visual affirmation that you are closing that's it just puts you in a positive frame of mind, and that's what's going on now. And, of course, the reverse of that, if you suddenly lose contact, the visual link yeah. to the car in front, yeah. then you feel all at sea. Of course, your team will be telling you everything about all the intervals, but it's a mental block. And, and that's the discipline in endurance racing, because even when he goes into the pit lane and disappears from your sight, you're still chasing. Or even when you go into the pit lane and you drop way back, you're still chasing, and you have to just keep your line, keep your length, get those laps rattled in and rattled in and rattled in. You know, it's a 24-hour race, and by definition, it is a long, drawn-out process. You don't win it on the first lap, you don't win it on the last lap, or you rarely win it on the last lap, and it's all the laps in between. And how many have we done now? Uh, oh, I can't even 255 laps are on the five. lap 256, so progressing. Quite nice. So we have had quite a, a, a large number of full course yellows. We've had eight so far, and uh, one of those didn't lead to safety car period, didn't go on to that. And uh, another one went on to the red flag, of course, when we had the number 16 Porsche in the barriers. Fortunately, without uh, injury to the driver, Matt Payne, the, the Kiwi, hopefully he's uh, going to be fine. But anybody who hits the barriers is going to feel a little bit achy tomorrow. That's no for sure. kidding. No kidding. That, that will probably have rung his bell, so he will be feeling very sore for the next week or so. Did we document that Danny Junkadea uh, 30 laps ago, 28 laps ago, set the fastest race lap? 218.174. So that was in the meat of the first stint after the red flag. Uh, who had it before? Alessio Piccariello did, didn't he? 
Uh, yes, yes, he did. Yeah, he'd set a, uh, a 218 something, and it's now down to 218.174. Uh, and Danny currently doing a 220.3. Yeah, 218.193 has been better to 218.174. Wow. We yeah. are dealing in thousands of a second. You're yeah. well spotted. I hadn't noticed. Two hundreds? No, I hadn't either. I, I just happened to see it because it's at the top of our timing screen. But uh, that car only. Uh, Danny Junker Day is uh, Mercedes he's driving only had the fastest sector in sector two sector one the fastest sector is the 98 Rover uh, car or when Augusta Farfus was driving it. So BMW in the first sector of the lap yeah. the second sector of the lap is Danny Junker Day in a Mercedes the third sector is Alessio Picariello in a Porsche yeah. that's rather nice. Yeah so the Ferrari isn't the quickest or has not set the quickest sector time in any of the, seg the uh, segments and yet and, and again, this is what BOP is all about. It's about maximizing the potential of the car, not to, not for all cars to be equal at all points on all tracks. That's not what endurance racing is about. That's not what multi-car racing is about. Yes, if it's in Jeep, uh, Formula 2 or Formula 3 or Formula 4, then all the cars that are supposed to be identical are supposed to be identical everywhere. But in multi, you know, multi-class racing, or in this case, the same category GT3 but with half a dozen different types of car they, they make their speed in different ways okay you're well, better under braking you're better under acceleration you've got better mid corner you've got better turn into apex we've got a fantastic comparison yeah. right on track we've got the Aston Martin in fifth place overall Maxime Martin he's been caught but not yet passed by Dennis Olsen in the KCMG Porsche they are super super close now bear in mind the first sector of the lap that is where the fastest time has been set by a BMW. The second yeah. sector is a Mercedes. That doesn't help either of those. The third sector is a Porsche. So that should theoretically be where Dennis Olsen has an advantage and maybe might be able to rest fifth place from Maxime Martin. But, you know, Maxime, he's royalty here at spa Frankenstein. You can't overtake him. Yeah. Disrespectful, frankly. Yeah, exactly right. Had good top end speed at the end of the Kemmel straight. Just allowed him to stop the Porsche even with a tow getting up behind so these very lurid colored cars the the bright day glow yellow of the Aston and that that sort of bizarre blue roof rails of uh, the Porsche well, it, it, I mean really accentuates the the shape of the 911 body doesn't it that, it's that great long, it's, that is fantastic. properly swoopy and uh, can't see enough of that no, exactly but uh, it's certainly attacking down through curve Jackie Hicks. Yeah. It looks as though Dennis Olsen was able to put the power down earlier than Maxime Martin could do ahead of him in the Aston Martin. But as we heard from Marco Sorensen, teammate to Maxime Martin, they don't think they've got the pace. They've not been riding their luck. They've just been maximizing their opportunity. Yeah. I think that's one, one way of saying it. But we're very nearly at the halfway point of the race, seven more yeah. minutes, and we've got 12 hours on the clock. And of course, for example, if the positions can swap, there is a points difference uh, that Dennis Olsen is aiming for at the moment. And uh, when you get to the 12-hour point in the race, fifth place pays five points, for sixth place pays four. And points make prizes, apparently. Yep, exactly right. And Dennis Olsen, we've seen him in a couple of side-by-side -side moves down through Eau Rouge. And let's see if we get another one lining up. The Porsche should make a better fist of sector two than the Aston. The Aston being held up, but the car dives into the pit lane. So probably not a disadvantage but it does put Dennis Olsen in a very good position to try a move in Eau Rouge. Maxime defends a little early down into La Source but he's sort of parked on the apex and that means that Olsen does not get on the gas any quicker. Just behind them Matt Campbell only one second back 1.6 seconds back down the hill comes Maxi Martin, Dennis Olsen with those bright blue lights right behind, and the next car through is Matt Campbell in his Porsche there. In fact, I think there might be a back marker between yeah, no, no, them. But they've got Marvin Kirchhofer in the McLaren closing in on Campbell. He's just a third of a second down. Oh, yes, so you're right. we've got so a four-car battle. It's yeah. two two-car battles. And for some reason, I suddenly got a desire to have a Beach Dean ice cream. Is it because <laughs> I've just seen it written on the flank of the car in fifth yeah, place? Definitely. Quite possibly a while ago, it was chips. My diet is clearly not help, healthy at all. Maxi Martin holding on to the Aston Martin in fifth place, but for how much longer? But maybe Dennis Olsen will be distracted if Matt Campbell can get onto his tail. But I think this is the lap that Dennis Olsen has got to make a pounce. And in turn, Matt Campbell's got to look out for that 38 yeah. Jota at, uh, McLaren that's been going so well in the recent laps. Well, a real problem now for the director is that 12 seconds ahead of these four, 
is the Max Hesse Dani Junker Dea battle, which is still only 1.1 seconds apart. So, I mean, that's that sort of a gap. So, you're looking then at a two car battle for second, a two car battle for fourth, and a two car battle for sixth, which is effectively a four car battle for fourth. And no, four throw... minutes before the points. Exactly. So and you've I got to throw... watch both of them. Right, so the last point at the moment goes to ninth place. It's Mikel Grenier, the group yeah. at M Mercedes, but that's only. What are we looking at? 1.1 seconds clear of Ma Maximilian Gutz in the and, number and two Mercedes as well. And only 1.8 seconds ahead of Nick Nielsen, who's currently in 11th place. So Grenier has got two cars, one in either mirror, basically, who could easily snaffle that last point in the next three minutes, four minutes and 18 seconds. So, yeah. Well, I think we can safely say that, uh, that with uh, a long way to go to its, its pit stop because it's uh, still uh, under 40 minutes. So it's got 25 minutes to play with. Nicky Katzberg yeah. ought to still be in front in the Rover Racing BMW. Car number 98, he's 17 and a half seconds clear of his teammate Max Hess. But Max Hess is under a lot of pressure from Danny Junker there now to one minute, uh, sorry, one second precisely between second and third. Oh, what's happened in Oh, the number 21 five. Ferrari and the oh. number five. Hold on, this is an important uh, Mercedes. That's Arjun Maini, who's second in the yes. Gold Cup class. They're side by side. David yeah. Perel gets going in the 21 Ferrari. This is the one that's had lots of delays. It's down in 46th position. Is there any damage? Can't see if it's sitting down. There's more gravel on the track. Well, Arjun, Arjun Maini Maini needs to get going. He's got a, a lap in hand over Jens Klingman, but that's only two minutes. Is he waiting? He's waiting at the side of the track, presumably to be flagged clear, but there's a whole run of cars There's come up the hill. Yeah. Can he get going on his own? Yes, no. Is it steaming a little bit? Uh, so it could, the, the contact clearly there. Is there any damage to that number five Mercedes? Is it Lake Cobb? It's got through the first part of the corner, just hasn't got as far as the left hand part, the second part of that S at the top of the Camel Straight. So. Let's keep an eye on that, but it's is, suddenly for Dorian is Pan, the right that it stretches. Is headlight pointing down at the ground? Has he got right front damage? I think he has. Right, he was second in the Gold Cup yeah. at, the, at that stage, but Dorian Pan leading it comfortably in 19th place overall for the Iron Dames Ferrari crew, so that's well, a, that, an even that's stronger a change advantage. around because they were in second and the number five car was leading, and here's where it all happens. Okay, background of the shot. Oh, oh, with the Mercedes diving up the inside, no, and no. I'm afraid that what, was him lunging up the inside. Yes, that was that was uh, Arjun Maini diving yeah. up the inside. So David Perel, the innocent party, glad to see that David got going. They've had enough problems in the 21 AF course of Ferrari. They're down in 46th right. position, but and uh, with two minutes to go until points are awarded, we're going full course yellow, aren't we? Because that car is not moving. He's been there two minutes already. And that will freeze the points. I, yeah. I don't see that that car is going to... I'm not sure how much longer Alan Adam is going to give him, but I think he's probably burned that particular bridge. On board with Danny Junker there. That's Max Hess right in front of us. Seven tenths of a second, that's what yeah. it's come down to. It was going down by a tenth of a second a lap, and now it's coming down by three tenths, four tenths of a second a lap. But as they accelerate down past the old pits, the heritage pits, if you will, into Eau Rouge, the gap opens out again. Of course, the BMW got the power down earlier because it was leaving La Source the earlier. Now, coming up the Camel Straight, can we see a closure on the car well, in front? Yes, we can. It's gaining a little, a little, but not close flags. enough. There they are. At, so at the top of the hill. Yeah. 10 seconds, full course yellow. Yeah, here we go. Full course yellow in uh, 10 seconds. And so that will mean that Danny Junkadea can't pass here under yellow flags. And uh, sensibly, Max yeah, has a full course yellow now. slow dry down. And there you go. Full course yellow declared. And full course. You also saw the countdown there on the screen, by the way, and that's so the driver knows how long it is without a 10 second verbal countdown so that he gets down onto the speed limiter. Because just pressing the speed limit button if you're doing 160 miles an hour it ain't, ain't cutting it. <laughs> Luckily for them, they were already heading up into a big braking zone with yellow flags out. So, um, yeah. Uh, pit stops. OK, so 46 comes in, Fred Vervish, Marco Mappelli comes in in the number six car. Uh, yeah, OK, so this could trigger who needs a stop. Well, right now, nobody needs a stop because there are 13 seconds to go. And in 10 seconds, points will be awarded.
That's pretty instant, isn't it? Yeah. Five seconds till points. Three, two, one. You get points, you get points, you get points. Nicky Katzberg, Max Hesser, Danny Junkadea, they're the top three. Points for fourth to Antonio Fuoco in a 71 car, 95 Aston in fifth, uh, the 47 Porsche in sixth, the uh, Marvin Kirchhofer, seventh, got by Matt Campbell. Uh, eighth for the 74 Porsche and ninth final point going to Mikael Grenier held off Maxi Gertz and Nick Nielsen. And now it is pit stop a go go. Most teams have less than 10 minutes left on their driving allowance. There you can see the Iron Dames in. So that was Dorian Pan, the pink car, 19th place, but leading the Gold Cup. And the car in behind uh, AF Corsa Ferrari, that is the one that, that uh, was hit by Arjun Maini. David Perel's got out and yeah. BAL on the windscreen. That means Alessandro yeah. Balzan has got on board us. Having a quick look, well, but he's going to go back into the garage. He just handed over, hadn't he, last time to David Perel. Yeah, but uh, driving change. Now, that yeah. I couldn't see any damage on the rear of the car, oh. but it was quite a big hit. Also, couldn't see a driver in there. So, although oh. the name has changed, that might be a default as, as uh, David Perel unplugged. Um, so there was nobody in the cockpit, which okay, suggests it may not be the fastest. They fuel first because it's always going to need fuel. And if it doesn't come out of the garage, you can pump it out. Now, what happens after you get past the halfway point in the race? Uh, Cars get pushed back into home? the garage? No, no, not yet. We've got another oh, two no, and a bit okay. hours, but so uh, this is the oh, point at which... Uh, technical, five minute technical. Technicals are starting Ooh. to happen. We've gone past the halfway point. Well, you're the race. allowed to do it, yes. Oh, good point. And so various cars getting pushed back into the garage as the earliest instant. We're under full course yellow. It makes sense. The first chance you could do it. Now, ah. is the race leader going to be? Well, let's come in. Nicky Katzberg, of course, he had a long way still to go on his potential pit stop time. 20 minutes in, but the front end, and oh, no, I thought that was going to be wheeled around. Not yet. Now then. No, they're just doing, this is just a standard stop. So far. So far. Now then, if our TV director showed us what was happening at La Source, we could guess whether or not we're going to go to safety car, in which case, suddenly everybody's doing their five minute technical. But if the Porsche has been moved, then this is going to be full course yellow only and not go safety car. All right, another element, we're having passed the ah. halfway he meet uh, Le Corp, uh, but Le the Corp, top of the yeah. hill is where the... What did I uh, say, La Source? Yeah, you did. I did you got away with it. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely fine. Yeah. Right, track limit warnings all reset. The halfway point in the race, so you, 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 naughty people, you're fine. Yeah. You Your get, slate has been cleaned. You get no penalty, you get no penalty, and you get no penalty. So Argemini out of the car, that has all the hallmarks of out of the race. It does appear that way. So you can see all various bits of bodywork, well, not bodywork, sort of wheel arch liners uh, lying out in the circuit. I don't know, just bits chunks of, of tire, rubber, frankly, tire well, that, debris. Yeah, that's a shredded tire. That yeah. you know, that that's is, out. Yeah, that is that is out of the race. So the Beach Dean Aston Martin, the remaining one of the pair, Maxime Martin, into the pit lane. He took the points for fifth place. Well, that's a, a useful thing. And as, as his teammate, Marco Sorensen, said, just can't find the pace for the Aston Martin this weekend. However, they're doing what they can. Fifth place, a very good position to be in. Martin, you're looking at the number five Mercedes as it's uh, put onto the flak bed. It's almost off the front page of our timing screen. And uh, down onto terra firma. Suddenly, for some reason, the name of the driver has changed to uh, Gabriele Piana. We had Arjun Maini at the wheel of the, the car at the point of contact. So yeah. it's another one of those slightly strange ones on the timing screen. It's uh, the other two drivers in the car who haven't been named, Hubert Hout and Florian Schultzer, but uh, we're fairly confident that it was Arjun Maini because that was the name on the screen when the impact was had with the 21 Ferrari, which uh, was driven again, by David we, Perel. We saw when... David Perel unplugged, the screen went back to Alessandro Balzan. Does it automatically default, do you think, to what, driver to one? The, uh, could, could, yeah, well... Do you remember when the, when the 21 Ferrari was wheeled back into the garage, there was nobody in it, but the name had changed? So maybe it defaults back to whatever their default driver setting well, maybe, is, driver it, one. Maybe it goes back to the driver who was in it before them, because Gabriele Piano was in before Arjun Maini oh, okay. in that uh, cycle yeah. through. Yeah. Right, Ooh. cars coming back out of the garage is having done presumably their, their yeah. 
uh, technical stop. They've got it out of the, under the way, which you might as well do if it's a full course yellow. It will minimise the difference. Andrea Bertolini slotted on still board third the 52 in class, car. Still third in Pro-Am, so, and they've done their technical. Because uh, there didn't seem to be any other reason why they'd be in. So Andrea Bertolini... Marius Sorg in the pit lane at the moment, Cumber 99. That's one of the two attempts to racing Audis. And, uh, and second again, that's had a in class behind Jordan Love. And they were on the same lap. Now there is the 71 car. Antonio Fuoco has taken that over. 51 in the garage. So that is having its technical. Nick Nielsen in the doorway. So he's handing over two. He took it over from James Collado, right? Yes. So that leaves uh, Miguel Molina. Right, in, in the terms of the world of technicals, it's over. when you do your brake changes that certainly you've got to do it at some point in the race. Yep. And, uh, do it out on the pit apron. Some of the other teams prefer to wheel them back into the garage to attempt to racing. You know, for years, they've run their cars in very, very plain liveries. For a while, it was sort of a, a, a sort of soft metallic blue, and then it became matte blue, and then they went to the sort of grey colour and it's traditionally been their shade grey or black so they're remarkably plain but they, they almost like stealth runners in it does all help sorts when you've got races. a driver in the car when you're trying to do up wheels because then somebody's got their foot on the brake that did not have a foot on the brake so is there not a driver in the car or did he just not have his foot on the brake there is a driver in the car he just didn't have his foot on the brake because the wheel was rotating as the air gun man was trying to do up the air gun well, it says it's Nick Nielsen, but I thought we saw a driver change and it was Nick Nielsen when it came in. We will wait and see for it to reset in 11th place, still hanging on on the lead lap. So Andreas Zug, beg your pardon, not Andreas. M Marius. Uh, Marius. Insult to injury, I've just noticed uh, the five second time penalty for speeding the pit lane. Car number five, that's the car that stopped at the side of the circuit up at Le Com, uh, which uh, Arjun Maini was uh, well placed in the Gold Cup class, but unfortunately for them, that is uh, not going any further at the moment. Well, that was churning on the starter for a while, wasn't it? Before it decided, oh, all right, I'll start for you. Whoa, out they go. Didn't get to check the front. Uh -huh. Well, let's take a look. Here comes Rover Racing again. And Max Hesse. So, are they going to do the brake change on this car? Because they didn't on 98. Which means at some stage, they will need to. No, this is just a standard stop as well, surely. Fuel and tyres. You don't put new tyres on if you're then going to take them off and change the brakes. It would be going backwards to go forwards, wouldn't it? That's yeah. For sure. That would be the sort of doofus error that I would make. OK, so they've not used this safety car to do their brakes, well, which means they'll need another safety car to do their brakes. One feels that uh, there's every likelihood there'll be another safety car period. Agreed. Do we not? We've only got to halfway in the race, and this is the full course yellow period. Number nine. So, so BMW's first and second. Yeah. And of course, the order will flip around. Max Hess is another 50 car listed in the lead of the race, but that was by dint of its position in the pit lane. The teammate car, the sister car of Nicky Katzberg, came in. Nicky stayed on board. The Dutchman, absolutely loving life with some really quick uh, string of laps. He served his pit stop. He's back out on the track. So, when he gets around to the finish line again, he will go back into the lead relative to his teammate. But Danny Junkader has not come in of his pit stop he's uh no he has sorry i beg your pardon he will stay in that third position he's just in fact pretty much everyone has come in of course it's full course yellow yeah well full course yeah we haven't gone safety car yet have we no i'm, I'm watching and waiting and, and maybe that's why rover racing have not plumped for a technical but you know right now is actually a better time to do it than under a safety car because everybody's crawling around well, what we had before, bear in mind the um, 88 Codis ASP Mercedes was comfortably clear, a dozen seconds clear. They served their pit stops, and then there was a full course yellow that eventually 
uh, led to the red flag. However, that then moved them down to seventh or eighth position. They're working their way back up. It is in the timing. And what seesaws one way can just as easily yeah. seesaw the next yeah, way. Yeah, but then again, absolutely. it could equally go wrong for you again, and suddenly you're not half a lap down, you're an entire lap down. These are the small margins. So just waiting to see where the car is. The car deployed, in, safety but car Nikki procedure. Had that big lead before the pit stops. Okay, so now safety car, this is not the time to come in and do your technical because now all the cars speed up again. So the difference between the safety car and the full course yellow is that you do need, if you're going to stop for a long stop, you need everyone else to be going as slowly as possible. And that will be behind full course yellow. Just comparing the timings of the, the in the pits, one and a half sec, two seconds between Katzberg and Max Hess. So for the Max Hess car number 50, they gained a little bit of the time, but bear in mind they were dropping some distance behind Katzberg, so those positions should go back in favour of the 98 yep. car next, well, this time around. The car's halfway around the lap. Yeah, our timing screen and the timing tower disagree, um, but I, I'm tending to go with Katzberg being ahead of Junker Dea and Haas in, th Hesse in third. Uh, which seems to be likely. Um, does that mean then that the 88 Mercedes has not done a technical stop either? There's the safety car with the queue of cars behind. It has picked up the leader, which I think is it, Nicky Katzberg with that the, sort of pinky familiar, purple stripes. Yeah. 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 around the windscreen. The lights really do help at night. And, uh, yes, they really do. They help everybody. They? they help the marshals, yeah. they help the camera crews, they help help us to an extent. If more cars could have more colours on the roofs at night and, and different ways that they put the lighting around. Certainly on some of the cars, it's fantastic. Over the A pillar, yeah. right across the line, yeah. and down the C pillar to the rear of the car. We well, could certainly do with them uh, identifying their cars visibly in daylight hours as well. Oh, it's got different coloured mirrors. Yeah. That's fine when we're two feet away in the garage, not when it's doing 160 miles an hour, 100 feet from a camera. Yes, not when said mirrors have been knocked and fallen yeah. off the side yeah. of the car in side-by-side -side contact. But it's looking very good at the moment. We've just passed the halfway point in the Total Energies Spa 24 hours, and it's BMW from BMW, Mercedes, Aston Martin, and now up to fourth place overall. Mm -hmm. And the mark that really hasn't got a smile on its face Lamborghini have missed out in all of this. They were front runners, but both they and the Audi runners had problems from the opening hour of the race with suffering punctures, and a lot of their runners have fallen down the order accordingly. But certainly for the German marks at the front of the field, for BMW and for Mercedes, it's looking very good at this stage as we go into the second half of the race here at spa Frankenstein. Still warm, still air temperature just under 18 degrees Celsius, track temperature just over 18 degrees Celsius, but it's cool, it's, it's warmish. It's dry, there is no particular wind, so track conditions are as good as they can be, but there's gravel on just off the racing line, pretty much the whole way around the lap, and also loads of rubber detritus, as you'd expect when you've started a field of 66 runners, these GT3 chargers. Uh, they, they work their tyres very hard indeed, and any time you have the headlights, Martin, at the end of the track, you can see those great gobbits, those great balls of rubber, but if you run over them, they really do not help your handling. No, really don't at all, and... Uh you, uh, you, you need to try and avoid that because the hot tyres and the soft rubber that's stuck on the track do not make happy bedfellows the the tyre picks up. If you think about, you know, running cross country and, and through muddy fields and the amount of clag that sticks to your shoes or to your boots and, and then what that does for your grip levels, you can imagine exactly what it does for the tyres. So the safety car stays out and no indication yet of quite how soon it will come in. So right now, the race is in temporary abeyance. Doesn't stop you going in and out of the pit lane. Doesn't stop you uh, doing work in the pits. So uh, that is possible. However, nobody is in the pit lane with the exception. No, no, uh, no running cars are in the pit lane. 50 cars still running. We started with 66, so 16 have fallen, but it's the BMW's first and third at the moment. Nicky Katzberg leading the way, Max Hess in third, and in between them, it's the Mercedes, the 88 car from a Codis ASP with Danny Junkadea in the middle of a treble stint. Five o'clock in Central Europe, it is eight, that is 12, 11 
Eastern, and we are looking at the start of the Total Energy 24 Hours of Spa. A great start from the outside of the front row, put the Porsche into the lead. A, a, a front row start that they inherited after the K-Pax Lamborghini had its Super Bowl times taken away and was dropped to 30th on the grid. And this massive 65 car field Bruce Jones kept their noses clean in the first lap, in the first couple of minutes, in the first hours, in fact, because the expected flurry of pit stops when everybody had their tail up and were excited to go never quite emerged. What we did get was lots of very close racing. First victim of that was the number 107 Bentley. That would feature in the uh, bad luck charts quite a lot early in the race as well. But as ever, with all these cars in the same category and so competently crewed, close racing and occasionally a little too close was always going to be part of it. First notable incident, a puncture for the Barwell Lamborghini and a big moment for Stephen Grove, the Aussie going off at high speed. Battle between Lucas Stoltz in the pink Mercedes and Com Ledegar in the Porsche that had been the early leader. Ledegar losing that battle and then losing out to Raffaele Marcello as well in the 88 Mercedes as they drop down to fourth. Mercedes were part of the front running pack right from the very start. And our first retirement of the race was Cesar Gazzo, who had a big lose on the exit of Blanchimont, hit the wall hard, made it to the pits only to have to retire. The bus stop corner, always a point of fun, but uh, again, unfortunately, here was a drive we saw quite a lot of, not often going in the forward direction, three times before Jens Lieberhauser was hit and spun around. Another driver being given a tip, that was Antares Al being hit by Jonathan Gui up at the La Source hairpin. Who's that spinning? Yes, it's Jens Lieberhauser again, another assist. He didn't want any assists, but he kept on getting them. Getting quite used to it by that stage. A little further into the race, and another safety car came out after a four-car pileup at Le Com, at uh, uh, Pipaf, rather. Back to green flag racing. But again, with the field bunched up and with faster and slower cars mixing together, uh, there was always the potential for more drama. What there was also was massive three-car battle in the top half dozen, Porsche, Audi and uh, Ferrari, and then drama as uh, Al Faisal Al Sabaya ran into the back of the 91 Porsche, putting both his Mercedes and the Porsche out of the race on the spot again. After a safety car, back to green flag racing, and the Sky Mercedes in the thick of the action, carrying the camera, they seem to be playing a, a bit of a starring role. Side by side, two young chargers, Dennis Olsen and Nick Nielsen battling for supremacy in Ferrari and Porsche, and that battle will continue a little later. And again, unfortunate Jens Lieberhauser getting knocked into yet another spin. Karamoje finding somebody else's gravel uh, down at the Jackie X curve, and a high speed off that car would continue and would continue to cause its team plenty of trouble. But the race action was completely manic, as you can see, some brilliant camera angles. And now, unfortunately, Chris Frogger just running a little wider. Eau Rouge rejoined by Radion. Yes, in that Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes. But one of the crews that was really making progress was the 71 Iron Links Ferrari crew getting towards the sharp end of the field. But they had some epic battles. But grip was often a problem. Here's the Allied Racing Porsche leaving your shot entirely down at uh, Kurt Paul Freire, coming back onto Terra Firma. 88 Mercedes working its way through the field, going by the number two car. And again, Nick Nielsen, Dennis Olsen, Nielsen in the white Ferrari, Olsen in the Porsche, both giving just enough room to survive and no more. And bear in mind that number 47 Porsche from KCMG started stone last and worked its way in the first hour up 41 positions. And then a car that had worked its way from 30th, this is the K-Pax Racing Lamborghini, had just got into the lead. How cool is that? As the light went down, so did one of their tyres. A puncture cost it a lot of track position. Absolutely. Night fell fast after a long, warm afternoon and heading into the meaty part of the race for everybody else. But unfortunately, when you come round the corner and see headlights facing you, that's always a little bit of a worry. No major incidents in that one. And 
as we got into the nighttime hour as the party and the concerts continued for the fans. The race ground on for the teams and the drivers and with darkness comes a slightly less ability to see the potential issues, more punctures and more incidents for our drivers. Still yet to ascertain who got away with this one, playing a get out of jail card uh, very neatly. Nobody's put their hand up to that excursion in the gravel, but there were plenty of others that were well documented by the on-ball camera. Again, this guy Mercedes right in the thick of the action, once more going green after a safety car period. The safety car's been used a lot so far after a brief full course yellows for clear up. And the racing continued. Well, this was a moment where the 88 Acodis ASP Mercedes started to make a move, and as soon as it got to the front, Raffaele Marcello rattled clear to get 12 seconds clear of the grouping before another full course yellow. But in fact, the real timing disaster for the 88 crew was they made a pit stop when it was green, and then suddenly it wasn't green, and everybody else came in under full course yellow. So the lead went back down to seventh place. The 63 Lamborghini, unfortunately, its race was run with contact over and out for Albert Costa, and he yeah. couldn't understand why, but he came back and uh, in full explanation mode, said, I got out of the corner, I must have hit oil, and I think he was probably right. And then Alfred Renauer may have hit oil as well, but come what may, he hit the barriers and he was out of the race. That was two of the three Herbert Motorsport Porsches out of the mix. But at least the sister car, number 24, ever further towards the top of the charts, leading the Prime class very comfortably indeed. And again, another safety car period as we went green, the 88 Mercedes cleared off, building a dozen seconds or more of a lead, and then suddenly there were cars everywhere. The 107 Bentley had stopped at La Source, uh, 16 car went off very heavily at, at um, Blanchimont, but fortunately without injury to the driver. That brought out a red flag for very nearly an hour. And then as we got towards the midway point of the race, we started once more with this time a 1-2 for the Rover Racing BMWs. Now they had engineered that by short stinting in a one of the middle sections of the race between the six hour mark and the 12 hour mark and had managed to keep that track position despite the attempts of all their rivals and of course points awarded at six hours and at 12 hours as well as 24 hours most recent of our safety cars was for this incident up at Le Combe. Porsche getting very excited inside the Mercedes and uh, tagging the Mercedes out of the race, it would appear. So we are back with just half the race completed and half the race still to go. 98 Rover Racing BMW is the race leader. That is Nicky Katzberg, the Dutchman leading from Danny Junkadea in the 88 Mercedes. And Danny back in a car in which he had such a stunning run uh, after the last group of safety cars before we went red. Max Hesse is in third place for Rover Racing BMW. Former winner Maxime Martin is the best of the Aston Martins in fourth. But Nicky Katzberg absolutely flying. He just banged in the fastest lap of the race. And two nanoseconds later, or four seconds later, Danny Junkadella improves on that. So the night air is proving super, yeah. super sweet. We're past five o'clock in the morning. But it's a four second advantage for Nicky Katzberg, still BMW in the lead of the race. But Mercedes pushing very hard. And a BMW in third place for good measure. Stewards noting an incident at the pit exit between... It was the Mercedes being uh, given a little bit of a shove by the Lamborghini. Number 14 yeah. was the Lamborghini and the 93 Mercedes, of course, the Sky Tempesta racing car. There was a red light at pit exit and uh, clearly the Lamborghini driver, whichever one it was, it. did not see it quite <laughs> did in not time. See it. Yeah, it's the Emil Frey racing number 14 car. Um, Stuart White, Thomas Tuja and uh, Consta Lapalainen. Three drivers on board. Uh, Stuart White was in it, and I don't think he is now. I think it was, was it not Kuchler who was in it? No, now can't find it on the screen. Um, well, I'll just tell you, tell you one thing. Just having a shot looking at uh, the, the run down the slope from Bruxelles, the long right-hander into Curve Jackie Hicks, formerly known as Speaker's Corner. There is so much gravel on the circuit on the inside of the track. And bear in mind, in daylight hours, when the drivers could see it, poor Karim Auger turned up towards it and... Uh, found uh, no grip whatsoever. We saw him rotate into uh, the tire wall or into the gravel trap at least. And uh, so that is awaiting the drivers and in cover of full darkness, it's all the harder 
to get things right when you hit the gravel. Nikki Katzberg leading this race by 4.6 seconds, and I'm sensing maybe a bit of a charge from Danny Juncker there. But you know what? There is light already coming into the sky. We got past 5 o'clock. It's 10 past 5 in the morning here by 6 o'clock. Well, just over after 6 o'clock, so an hour from now, sun up. But we're getting light in the sky. That is real encouragement. Well, absolutely right. But the very late start, 4.45 p.m., means we finish at 4.45 p.m., so... Even by the time the teams are having lunch, there is still a big, big race left to play out. And we've started to see, once you get into the second 12 hours, once you're past halfway, teams are allowed to take their technical stop, which allows for a brake change. Now, it's a mandatory stop. Everybody must stop for the same period of time, whether you need to change brakes or not. And so we've seen some cars have taken it under the last full course yellow and others have not so we wait to see how that plays out now what do you do to keep yourself entertained yes you're chasing down the race leader you just set the fastest he set the fastest lap of the race you set the fastest lap the next time around your name is still danny Junkodea. you go faster still two minutes 17.9 seconds this is excellent lapping from the 88 mercedes acodis asp and that's the third time since midnight that he has set a fastest race lap. So great battle between him and race leader Nicky Katzberg. But right now, Danny Junkadea, you're on board with the fastest car in the race at the fastest it has been driven. Riding on board in second place in the Spa 24 hours in the night time as the first glimmer of light starts to come into the sky in the east with Danny Junkadea. He has just set two consecutive fastest race laps, battling with race leader Nicky Katzberg, who didn't improve on his previous race best last time round. Danny Junkadea now the fastest race lap here, 2 minutes 17.9 for the seven kilometer track so it's just over 4.7 miles and uh nikki katzberg the gap now down to 4.3 seconds it's staying pretty close but there are only two cars so far in this race that have had the ability to get into the lead of the race and then pull clear at the front it's the 98 rover racing bmw that's leading and the 88 acodis asp mercedes that's in second place we heard from the acodis crew saying this guy is fantastic when he gets clear air but clearly so too is that 98 rover racing bmw and right now the lamborghini that's the uh, Bar Black Bull sponsored one, uh, Barwell Motorsport. Uh, no, sorry, it's not the Barwell Motorsport car. It's the one of the Emil Fry Racing uh, Lamborghinis uh, is in the way. It's lapping at a perfectly good pace, but all along you'd be sure that Danny Junkadea wants that clear, wants to be able to get clear line of sight to the race leader, Nicky Katzberg. And in fact, on that lap, he lost two tenths of a second to the race leader. And you can understand why. I mean, it, it is a tiny amount over 24 hours. It's a tiny amount over seven kilometers of the lap, but when you're in the groove like that and he was absolutely nailing every apex then you don't need somebody in front of you who's just blunting your pace a little we ride on board now with max hesse in his rover racing bmw he's in third and he goes by a lamborghini so up to les combes at the top of the hill the old circuit went straight on from there. You didn't turn right. You went over the top, down the other side, through the Master King, all the way down through Berneville and Stavolo. Long, long circuit on public roads. And then eventually returned, and we'll get back to that part of the track as we start the climb from the valley. But in the meanwhile, diving down through Pouan, and you can see from the camera shots, Bruce, how much gravel there is now close to the circuit. Familiar spa viewers will know that for instance, here on the exit of Puon, that used to be all tarmac. Now there is a couple of metres of tarmac runoff, but there are gravel traps that have sprung up all over uh, the fringes of the circuit here. And that's had an effect on how drivers are making moves. They have to be a little bit less rash than perhaps they might otherwise have been. And it also has a knock-on effect on, on the flow of the race, because if cars go off, they tend to stay stuck. Yeah. whereas they wouldn't on tarmac. They absolutely do. So does it mean the drivers have to just haul it back in a little bit so they can't risk going over the curbs? And the other thing about going over the curbs, track limits. A couple of corners in particular the drivers are being pinged at. Uh, the exit of Radion and also down... Where was the other corner? It was the exit of Blanchimont they're being picked yeah. up for that. And a lot of the drivers in the first part of the race are going, I honestly don't know how I got pinged, but the, all those times, all those uh, accumulation 
of uh, penalties because with the, the first two you get off scot-free you go to your third penalty you start getting five seconds added to your next pit stop time it's not drive in stop for five seconds and go it's just your regular pit stop time plus an extra five seconds yeah. but then the next time you do it you get another five seconds added and so it accrues and that can be measured by the officials because there are two distinct styles of pit stop a full stop has to be a certain minimum specified time and a short stop also has to be a certain minimum specified time so they will know whether or not you've taken your five seconds you can't just do a pit stop and go well we took it we were just very quick you can't be very quick you can be a minimum of a certain time so it is easily measurable so that's a tough one to cheat there is your race leader Nikki Katzberg there's the second place car Danny Junkadea and in third place Max Hasser is just five seconds back so here he is in third spot this is in fact the second place car although it says third on the dash it is still a tight battle at the top. Three cars covered by nine seconds. Well, there is car number 50. That is Max Hesse. So when we're on board with Danny Junkadea, there's a little, woo, hello. Uh, there is a little uh, indicator on the on the dash that tells him what position is in. His says three, when it should, should actually still say two. As they saw the cars streaming down the hill through the Jackie X curve, uh, a couple fringing the gravel traps. The deal with track limits has also changed slightly, Bruce. Uh, exit of Eau Rouge over the top of Redion, if you cut the corner there, that's always an absolute guaranteed track limit. I mean, there's never any question about that. Ah, oh, problem in sector one, yellow flag at turn one at La Source. So somebody's had a bit of a, a saucy moment there. When um, it's not your day, it's not your day. <laughs> oh, here it's day and night and day. And the 32, one of the likely lads, were, were the 32 Audi crew from Team WRT, short refueling time 15 second time penalty where are they now they're falling down the order all the time we heard from Dries van Tor feeling very very yeah. depressed indeed and that was before they heard about this punishment they're in 13th place overall with Charvitz doing a very good job but his lap time at the moment is two and a half seconds off the pace of those first three cars yeah. those two BMWs from Rover Racing and uh, the Acodis ASP Mercedes number 88 and so clearly the pace isn't there and now penalties on top Mind and they've you, had punctures so is everyone else you know, they, especially the top two, Katzberg and Junkadea, I mean, those are the two guys that could win it for their teams, and they are just having, you know, a heavyweight boxing match. Everybody else is is just waving away in the wind behind them. Max uh, Martin, you just saw there, in fourth place in the Aston Martin. Who's this at La Source? Right, there is a track vehicle there. And so somebody has gone out very wide and they are being dragged out of the gravel uh, under yellow flags, not even full course yellow, so I'm not quite sure what's happening there. OK, so if someone who's just watching for the first time in this race, they've just caught up, we're halfway through, just over halfway through. Of course, there are gravel traps now at various points around the circuit where before there were, con there were tarmac runoff areas and in one of those, one of the cars that's been deposited has just been or is being removed by one of the course vehicles. But just go a little offline, you don't get a second chance, you get into the gravel, sometimes you can drive through it, sometimes you can't. It's the number 27 Lamborghini. He's it to Tomlu Lopez. We saw him having it a spin is. earlier in the race up at Le Com, but uh, the Lamborghini, is it facing the right way or the wrong way? Quite hard was, to pick up. I was on trying the to figure who had, had got a sector one time and hadn't actually got a sector two time. It was either him or Sandy Mitchell. Sandy Mitchell is still going. No, so no it's definitely a, the 27th Yeah, yeah no, I can yeah. see it now. But when Mitchell's we absolutely see it, flying. He's one of the quickest drivers on the track. There we go. So is that to Tumula Lopez, another Lamborghini. It's just not Lamborghini's race, is it? Being dragged out of the gravel traps. Yellow flags at La Source, turn one here at Spa-Francorchamps as Isaac Tatumlo Lopez in the Lamborghini is dragged out of the gravel. He's gone wide, sweeping around this hairpin, right-handed first corner, and either been assisted or has dropped it off into the gravel trap and has needed to be towed out. And we ride on board at the end of the lap with Nicky Katzberg, the Dutchman who leads for Rover Racing. Well, down in the pits is Gemma Scott. Let's catch up with her. Cedric, we're coming up towards another stint for you. It's going to be working through the last of the nighttime hours and into the daylight. 
What can we expect in terms of changes in the performance? Well, you know, for, for now we've been uh, mainly on a down, so hopefully the next uh, 12 hours we start being on up again. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, the transition stint between night and day is always, uh, is always a nice one. But uh, you made it through the night, so technically the, the hardest part of the race. So, yeah, definitely look forward to jumping in back in the car and uh, see what we can do from now. We saw the contact a little while ago between 21, your car, and the number five. The damage wasn't so bad on your car? It was uh, yeah, a bit of damage. We had to, we lose, I, th I think, uh, two laps to repair again. But yeah, it was. we were lucky because there was a full course yellow, so we didn't lose as much. But still, it's a bit frustrating. It's been a, a difficult race so far with full course yellows, red flag, all sorts. But uh, hopefully, as you say, it can only get better. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it can only get better, so. Thanks a lot. Have a Thank great you. stint. Well, Cedric Spratt's really putting on a very brave face. Still there, got a smile on his has, face. which is great to see the Monegas racer been racing since started in single seaters quite some while ago. Right now, car number 14, we said there was that contact uh, pit exit. That car is now under full investigation. So the, clearly the car that got hit can't be blamed. That was the Sky Tempesta racing. Yeah, Mercedes. unless you reverse into the <laughs> yeah, car. Which he didn't, queue. trust me. <laughs> yes, exactly. Now, that's quite, that, that's quite a steep exit as well, because the, the full pit lane uses the Formula One pit lane, the familiar Grand Prix start on the level, and then goes round the corner all the way down the hill through the endurance pit lane, which was the original pit lane here as far. Originally, the grid, as, as we use in this race, is on the downhill section looking at one of the world's most famous, infamous corners, Eau Rouge. So you go all the way through both pit lanes, which means when you have to stop at the red light at the exit, that is right at the bottom of a very steep hill. Not sure any of these racing car clutches would allow you to select reverse and try and back up the hill anyway. So yeah, um, running into somebody behind a red light in a safety car in the pit lane, not your finest moment. No, Not your indeed, moment. And, and actually, for Lamborghini, it's just yet another indication that this is not really destined to be their race. There's so many Lamborghinis have had so many problems. Well, the best place of the Lamborghini is in uh, 19th place yeah. overall. That's uh, Marco Mapelli. Let's call that 20th place because those positions have changed. This is the K-Pax racing car that had to start 30th. It had set the best time in Super Bowl and uh, most upset indeed, but a technical infringement. No need to go into full details. It was to do with the air filter, but both sides had their side of the yeah, argument yeah. Uh, to put forward. But anyhow, it worked its way into the lead of the race, picked up a puncture, should have been in the top 10, but it's working its way back up there. 20th position. Marco Mapelli, his lap times, as good as most people, just outside the top six. So there is enough pace. And of course, where we are now, with a tiny bit of light coming into the sky, we will get towards dawn, we will get towards the track warming up again, and then let's see. But it was the Lamborghinis and it was the Audis, sisters really under the skin, uh, that were picking up the punctures early in the race. They tried to change the angle of the camber by as much as 10% on the Audis, but uh, I must say, since then it seems to have worked, but of course the track temperatures have fallen away, maybe there's not as much gravel, because when we've had safety cars, we've had the track vehicles on there, sweeping as much of the circuit clean of the stones and the tire debris as they can, that has certainly been a helping hand. I, I think we're being a bit ambitious, I mean, you look in the camera shots, you can see an awful lot of debris around the circuit, not all of it will be gravel, quite a lot of it will be uh, just bits of tire that are worn off the track. Uh, Jordan Love, for the HALP Racing Team leading in the silver category. Now, there are half a dozen different categories. All the cars are exactly the same. They all confirm to conform to FIA GT3 regulations. So the cars are all the same, but the driver lineups are, the drivers are rated differently. In a pro class, you can have whatever you like. You've got Pro-Am, you've got the Am class, you've got gold driver lineups, you've got silver driver lineups. So there are all sorts of races within the race being battled for. And that number four, Halp Racing Mercedes, which has been the outright leader, actually, a, a couple of times because of the way their pit stops fall with other people's. Uh, that car is comfortably leading the silver class. Sarah Bovey for the Iron Dames, the all-female crew car, four female drivers in the uh, third of the cars entered by Iron Lynx. They are leading the Gold Cup. Uh, leading Pro-Am is the number 24 uh, Porsche, which is down in 21st place. In fact, that's been hanging around 24th place rather uh, symmetrically for a while. 
And Nicky Katzberg is our outright leader. There he is. That is the pro class. And the lead is now out to 4.2 seconds. Danny Junkadea is the next car through the shot. There he is behind Nicky Katzberg, but the gap has grown. Uh, last time round, Katzberg at 2.19.1, 2.18.9 for Junkadea. So he's possibly burnt the best of his tyres off with a sequence of fastest race laps, but still got plenty left in the hold. This is not going to be won anytime soon, Bruce Jones. No, but all the cars from fourth place backwards are losing ground to those first three, those two BMWs and the meat in the sandwich, the number 88, a Codis ASP Mercedes. They're able to lap under two minutes 20. At this point in the race, that is very good indeed, but the best of the rest, they're the wrong side of that two minute 20 margin. That is why it's an 11 second gap from Max Hess in third place in the number 50 BMW to the 95 Aston Martin from Maxime Martin, Belgian from the... Oh, I joked earlier about the royalty from Spa Francorchamps, but when two generations of a family have won the Spa 24 hours, I think you don't have to have too much of a, a leap of faith there to give them that title. But what a strong lineup for the Aston Martin. None of the crew confident the car has got the ultimate pace, but they're doing the best with what they have to hand. And fantastic job to be up in fourth place for the Beach Dean AMR. And, and listen, you know, it's fourth place overall there's still well over 11 hours left to go. And, and the way they have come up the order, they may not have, they may not think they have ultimate front running pace, but you need another element to win a race like this. You need luck to be on your side. You need the brakes that would take somebody else out of the race to fall slightly better for you. And it's a combination of everything you do and everything that happens around you and sometimes luck's on your side and you dodge a bullet and sometimes it's not and you get clattered out of the race and it's the rare times where you dodge the bullet that turn these races around and you know they're fourth they're not quite lapping as quickly as the leaders but they are lapping as quickly as anybody else in the top 20. so maxi martin in fourth place it's only a step away from the podium and 11 hours to make that step. And all it takes is one unfortunately timed pit stop. You come in, it's all green, no yeah. chance of any safety car until suddenly there's a safety car. And then those that come in under the safety car period, they can benefit enormously. We saw that with the 88 Akodis ASP Mercedes. It lost a 12 second advantage, which is quite a lot in this race. However, it's still in the fight, still in second place, only four seconds down on the race leader. The race leader, though, is Nicky Katzberg for Rover Racing, a former winner of this event back in 2015 in the BMW Z4, but uh, looking very strong at the moment, but already more light coming into the sky. It will have an effect on track temperatures. It'll have effect on morale, not just for the drivers, for the teams as well. So we're truly underway. Skies lightning as Bar Francorchamps. Official sun up will be 6.02 local time. It is currently 5.28, so we're half an hour away from official lighting up, lights off time, but uh, it's still pretty dark. I mean, there's a lot of trees around. There's not a huge amount of cloud cover, but it is still pretty dark. On board with the Sky Tempesta Racing Mercedes. This is not an immediate battle for position with the car in front, which is the 99. And that is uh, an Audi. Dives to the inside, dives to the outside, trying to find a way around. This is a good move down. Again, another slight change is there seems to be more grip on the outside there at, at Rivage at Bruxelles than there has been in previous years. So that was a, a good move around the outside. Uh, you know, in anything other than good conditions, that does not work. You're, you're falling off on the outside of the circuit, but he managed to make that stick. If this is the first time you've ever watched the Spa 24 hours, you might just presume every year it's held in glorious summer sunshine. I can every guarantee it is. it is not. This has been a remarkable week here. We had a huge speed 
uh, heat spike in Europe uh, a couple of weeks ago. We saw temperatures uh, way record temperatures set in a number of countries, particularly in northern Europe. But uh, right here, right now, all the drivers out there on the circuit as the sky starts to lighten half an hour until official dawn here, official sun up and conditions are probably, Martin, as good as they've been since the start of the race, which is pretty unusual for Spa, particularly yeah. when you started with a record field of 66 cars. Well, probably as good as they've been in four or five years here, actually, because we've not had any interruptions because of weather. And, and actually, this sort of time in the dawn, if there had been rain in the last few days or possibly even the last couple of weeks, that's where you'd start to get the warmth uh, of, of the earth bringing it out with the the temperature inversion, the cooler air, that's where you get the morning fog, but we've not got that either. So uh, it is forecast to rain on Monday. So, so hopefully that won't advance by 24 hours and we, we should be good to go because actually what this race really doesn't need is any more curveballs being thrown in. The, the addition of a lot of gravel traps around the circuit has taken a while for drivers to adjust to. Now, as the sky lightens and visibility starts to get a little better and you're less reliant on your headlights to actually help you see things then we we may even see the pace start to pick up again there's a factor in the race that that is going to be the lurking gorilla in the room between 12 hours and 24 hours each team must make what's called a technical pit stop now this is a minimum time stop which allows for brake changes because on some of these cars historically the brakes have been a little marginal particularly in hot races particularly in tough races on uh, on brakes this is not the toughest on brakes it's kind of tough on engines because you spend more than 70 percent of the lap at full throttle but but that is the regulation so some cars under the last full course yellow before we went to a safety car which is about 40 minutes ago have made their technical pit stop others have yet to make it now it is conceivable that for the next 11 hours and, and 15 minutes before the checker flag comes out it will go green i wouldn't put much money on it so Everybody who hasn't made that technical pit stop, and that includes the Rover Racing BMWs of Nicky Katzberg here in first, and his teammate Max Hesse in third, and the 88 uh, of Danny Junkerdeer in second place, that Mercedes, they, we know, have not made that stop, but a number of the other cars in the top 10 have made that stop. So they're gambling on the fact that when they want to do it, there will be a safety car that falls, or not a safety car, you don't want to do it under safety car, you want to do it under full course yellow, there will be a full course yellow that falls nicely in their pit window. And also they don't want to wait for that safety car to be 10 hours from now, because by then they'll have absolute next to no braking yeah. potential at all. Of course, some of them could go the whole way, but your brake performance will have dropped away. So really, ideally for them, the next hour should be the time they get this, well, the, the this point, move the sorted. The point is, even if your brakes could last, you're not allowed to exactly. go the whole way. You still have to make this technical stop. So it is still the, the gorilla in the room. And the exciting bit for us is there is no column on the timing screen that shows us who's done it and who hasn't. So, um. So we, we now have to, uh, and unfortunately, also our, our um, pit stop timing length is only the last pit stop. So uh, we can see that there is, so for instance, Nicky Katzberg, the leader, a two minute pit stop last time in, but the cars that are eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th had four minute pit stops. So you're assuming that there's been a technical in those cars probably ought to be writing those things down. OK, well, <laughs> here, with your notebooks, note these two numbers down, 71 and 47. There's 71 on the screen. That, we think, has done a technical pit stop. It's in seventh place overall. But of course, if it gains back those, uh, you know, that chunk of time when the rivals come in, that car and the 47 Porsche in behind KCMG, that has also served a technical pit stop. They will come up the order again when all has been sorted. Yeah. Martin is now going to get a piece well, of paper out. The, the thing is, they'll instantly gain two minutes. Yeah. I, except they won't if the others do it under a full course yellow because they'll be trudging around at 80 kilometers now. So they'll only gain what they actually lost. 
and it won't be two minutes. They'll spend two minutes longer in the pit lane, but everybody else won't be at full racing speed. So it, it does make a, a difference how and when you take it. You cannot take it under green flag conditions. You just can't. So some words from Bruce Jones. Well, I write things down. <laughs> I'm, I'm now going to try and, and compile a list of uh, who's done technical stops. For 45 Saturday afternoon, beautiful oh, weather. Sorry, in I thought you were calling the numbers Shaw. out. No, no, 4 <laughs> 45, 45 is not bingo. I'll cross those out. And bear um, in mind that uh, we had 66 cars. We've lost 16 of those. We have 50 cars still running. With Charlie Eastwood bringing up the rear, the heart of racing team Aston Martin that lost a huge amount of time early in the race. In fact, it's 36 laps down. But when it's been lapping, it's been lapping on the pace. In fact, the last lap from Charlie Eastwood at 2 minutes 20.7 was as good as the drivers from fourth place backwards. So what could have been for the heart of racing team? But they didn't throw in the towel and uh, are still going. So 50th of the 50 runners still going. We have 11 hours and 10 minutes remaining in this event. We've had a haul of points claimed at the six hour point in the race with 12 points going to the driver leading the race and equally spread through each of the glasses. And then again at uh, the 12 hour point, another 12 point allocation for the driver leading outright. And in this case, it was Nicky Katzberg for Rover Racing, still leading the race, now gradually stretching clear little by little, 4.6 seconds to the good over Danny Junkadea. So it's uh, BMW from Mercedes and BMW in third place with Max Hess. And then a a 16 second gap back to Maxime Martin still weaving his magic in the Aston Martin number 95 from Beach Dean AMR and Maxi Book who has sort of been away from frontline GT racing but he's back it's almost like 10 years have, have passed since he was absolutely in his pop it's probably only eight but it's he's in third place for the Grupa M racing team with their Mercedes AMG so what have you found out Martin uh, a number of cars have made their technical stops, I including this, this car, 71, the Iron Links car of Davide Rigon. Now, this car in seventh place. Look at the timer on the right-hand side screen there, beside the rear-view mirror. 44 minutes and 55 seconds now. And that's interesting because the maximum length you can do in any stint without coming in and, and doing a pit stop is 65 minutes. So he's got another 20 minutes maximum on the stint. Now. You can't allow that to elapse while you're halfway around the lap. You must have stopped before it gets to 65 minutes or the seconds that you are over are added to your next pit stop. So there is that part of the strategy as well. Um, if a safety car comes out while you're still within your time limit, then that allows you to then come into the pits on that lap where the time elapsed. However, to do that, you first will have to have done at least two laps behind full course yellow. So it's your own fault if you actually lose the time during the safety car. But Davide Rigon chasing down Stain Scottors now for sixth place. Always interesting looking at the bottom of the timing screen because that's where we get news of penalties. Car number 14, it was the Emil Fry Racing Lamborghini. That has been given five-second penalty for clattering into the back of the Mercedes that was at a standstill because the red lights were on at pit exit. It was the Sky Tempesta racing car that was hit. However, car in third place overall, no further action. That's important. The car in third was an incident up at turn five, which is at Lecom with car number 57. That was the much maligned and much spun around Liebhauser car. Uh, so no further action. So that must have been a scary moment for Rover Racing, waiting to find out if their car in third place with their younger drivers. Max Hess driving that at the moment was going to be hit by a penalty. Give it a five, 10 second penalty. That would drop it behind, behind the 95 Aston Martin of Maxime Martin. But at least that is out of their hair now. They don't have to consider that one. Well, at least for the 57 crew, it was American driver Russell Ward who got hit this time because three times in the first couple of hours, it was Jens Lieberhauser who got clattered and that wasn't at Eau Rouge, they were all at Le Com and, and each time got knocked off by somebody different. So the passenger door, the right-hand side door in that car is doing an awful lot of heavy lifting. I mean, it's just basically keeping them in one piece. It doesn't even appear to have a dent in it and yet they've been knocked off the track four times. Interesting little battle we've just been seeing between the number two Mercedes with the pink livery, the BWT livery, Stein shot horse, young Dutch racer on board. He's been caught by Davide Rigon. There's half a second between them. But of course, Davide Rigon, the 71 Ferrari, has done its technical pit stop, whereas yep. the number two Mercedes certainly has not. 
purple sector three for staying Scotthorst. That's a, that is a big lap. Is that genuine? 35.6 sector. Well, it's working well under pressure. So just to reiterate, the cars at the front end of the field are at the front end of the field. Some of them because they have not served their technical pit stop, which will add probably around two minutes of their time. So that is Nicky Katzberg yeah. in first place. Danny Junkadea in second place in the 88 Mercedes. Third place, likewise, the second of the Rover Racing BMWs has not served its technical pit stop. Maxi Martin, there's a bit of a theme going on here, in the Aston Martin in fourth hasn't. Neither has Maxi Buk in fifth place or Steinshot Horse in sixth. But the driver behind him, Davide Rigon, the 71 Iron Lynx Ferrari that has had a history of working its way up the order in this race certainly has and so has Dennis Olsen who's just three seconds behind him in the KCMG Porter that's car number 47 so this order is going to have a shuffle at some stage but we're waiting just waiting if there's another full course yellow that is when the front runners will go that is the maximum time that I can gain by coming in because the cars will be going slowly around the track and if I get my technical done during yeah. that point rather than when it turns to safety car period which often can do do, and that's what they're waiting for but they could be waiting and waiting the sweat will start to form on their brow they don't want to go deep in this race before they get their technical pit stop done well it's still got 11 hours so, uh, so they do. Minutes, uh, neither of the rover racing bmws that are first and third have in fact none of the top six have but neither of the rover racing cars they've only got two cars in the fight they've only got two dogs in the fight neither of them have done it of iron links 71 and 51 have both done their technical and their all-female crew cars, the Iron Dames, has not done its technical stop. So they clearly didn't feel they had enough manpower to throw at three cars in one go, but the better placed pro cars, 71 and 51, they have done. Now, the Iron Dames are not in the pro class. They are leading the Gold Cup and they're leading the Gold Cup very comfortably indeed so they've got leeway to do it the next time there's a full course yellow and with 11 hours and three minutes to go there will be another full course one of the yellow. best corners on the circuit Adion, you go through Eau Rouge over the crest by two kilometers an hour we're riding on board with the car that's fastest it's the inception racing uh, McLaren Se Sebastian Prio second generation racer at the wheel at the moment he's having a real success he was the North American Porsche Carrera Cup champion last year and he's just getting his uh, tail end into a lot of cars at the moment showing with American racer Brendan Ari but interesting it's had its problems early yes. in the race it yeah. really had setbacks but uh, Seb Prio pressing on and a very quick indeed. Some people didn't realize it was a 24 hour race. They must have thought it was 12 hours. We've done that. We're, in fact, nearly got 13 hours on the clock. But They're channeling me, those guys. <laughs> <laughs> they are absolutely channeling us. It's, it's, it's bizarre, actually. This, this year's 24 hour race, everybody is coming in going, I'm absolutely sh shattered. I mean, it just absolutely, it, it almost feels going into to Saturday start from almost everybody I've talked to is that we're getting towards the end of the race rather than standing by for the beginning of it. So it's a it's a very bizarre, very bizarre concept. I mean, there's an awful lot, you know, four free practice sessions, there's qualifying, there's nighttime sessions, there's Super Bowl, there's a lot of track time, there's a lot of very long days, especially for the mechanics. First in, last out, and that makes the days and the week here very tiring indeed. And just another thing to point out is the fact that uh, the race started at 4.45, which is very late for a 24-hour race to start, or other sporting events potentially moving it back, but it does mean not only do you start late, it means you finish late. So when you get to dawn, we're almost at dawn now, in the next uh, half hour we should have sun up, that means you've got an awful lot long work to go after the sun has come into the sky. Certainly no three o'clock finish for us. No, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, by the time you get to breakfast time, you've, you've still got an enormous race. Lunchtime, still got a lot of racing to do. It's nearly tea time. Can we please make this stop soon? Oh, don't worry, we will. Well, now, as the light starts to aid the camera lenses, it is a little bit less of identification by headlight lights and coloured lights alone. We can actually see the shapes of the cars, the colours of the cars. Up until now, for the last eight hours, predominantly, it's been trying to identify lighting patterns to, to see who is what and, and what is where. Now, Bruce, 20 minutes ago, 25 minutes ago, the beginning, well, how long have they been going? Actually, 45 minutes ago. At the beginning of this stint, for both cars, Nicky Kasberg and Danny Junkadea behind him, they were 
driving faster than anybody who's driven in the race so far. Now, their tyres are almost a stint old, but the fuel level is way lower. So clearly, burning off fuel has less effect than having fresh tyres on. Yeah, no, he, he's exactly that. But in fact, it must be said that Max Hess took a few more laps to get up to stride in third place. He is still lapping quite honestly as well. Another person who's going very well is Matt Campbell. He's lapping also in the two minute nineties, but his car, the 74 uh, Porsche is down in 10th place overall, but he is very close to the tail of Marvin Kirchhofer in the McLaren number 38. Has also done its two minute mandatory extra long stop. So it is, it has done a technical, so it, potentially has that slight incremental change and in fact outside the top half dozen the remainder of the top 10 have all done their technical stops so when the top half doesn't get to do it then those gaps will close again a little so um, it won't be a full two minutes but it will close by the amount that it's stretched out effectively within a few seconds it'll be a big difference so you can still see lots of lumps of, of rubber to grip the track particularly when in cornering, the, tar the, the tarmac just gradually pulls tiny bits off the tire and they sort of roll up into little glue balls and sometimes they get thrown off and you see that sort of grayness around the edge of the track, the little marbles. Sometimes they clump together either in a wheel rim or in a wheel arch or on the edge of the tire or something and they come off as big fistfuls of rubber and, and you can see again on the edge of the track those really big bits kind of tend to get thrown out and bounce away but not all of them there's always debris in the way and that narrows the track effectively because you want to stay on the clean part to get the grip from your tires and when there's all that debris around the side and gravel and dust and dirt and grass it narrows the racetrack and so it then makes it harder again to get by such identical performance cars. And it does also mean when you're trying to do overtaking, you've got to be super, super cautious. There might be space for one car that is all clear and fine, but for Nicky Katzberg, leading by 5.4 seconds, Danny Yucadella still giving chase, but it's BMW with its nose in front. It's getting lighter by the moment. Brilliant view from above the curve, Jackie. It's looking across the valley and up to the far side to the, the pit lane complex. So that's always light and bright through the night, but the rest of the circuit has been fully dark. And now the driver's eyes are getting a little bit of respite. The light is coming by increment with every single passing minute. And before the temperature starts to rise in the air and before the track temperature starts to rise as well, as visibility gets better, this is what drivers refer to as the happy hour. The cool air gives all the systems, gives the brakes a better chance to cool down, gives you better charge through the engine. The air is cooler, it doesn't get overheated so much. It's more efficient for the engine, so you get maximum power. You're still getting good grip. The track's not too cold, it doesn't get too hot, and, and the visibility level improves. So you can suddenly just push that little more, just a little fraction more, and habitually, this is sort of the time of day when we get the fastest race laps of all. Now, those came in a, in a big flurry from Nicky Katzberg and Danny Junkadea, the top two, about 40 minutes ago, 45 minutes ago, nearly, nearly getting on for an hour now when it was still pitch black. But they are now the lead two within two, maybe it's a real push, three laps of their next fuel stop. And then, although they'll have another 100 litres or so, 100 kilos, so it's 200 pounds worth of fuel on board, they will have brand new tyres. And that's going to make a massive difference. We should again see cars diving into new lap record or new fastest race lap. Just saw a car going into the pits. Uh, that is the leader of our... Silver Cup class. Silver Cup, Jordan Love, indeed. One of the out racing Mercedes, the sister car, now officially one of the retirements. That was the number five car that was uh, stuck on the kerb up at uh, the top of the crest of the hill at Le Cobb. So pit stops will be a coming, and one that maybe can only just come soon enough for Stein Schottelhorst. He's holding on to sixth place in the Get Speed AMG Mercedes, but he's been pushed so hard by Davide Rigon. The difference between them on the track is a, a quarter of a second, that 71. Uh, Iron Lynx Ferrari pushing so hard, but he's going to have to serve his pit stop sometime within about the next seven or eight laps. So maybe he doesn't want to do that thing that is very risky in this half light, which is going around the outside to make an overtaking maneuver, finding a bunch of gravel. And one thing, Martin, I do need to pick up on is the fact that uh, 
in under cover of darkness, you might be aware there's a, a, a sort of sway, a sweep of gravel that's been brought onto the circuit, but you don't know if it's going to be there next time around. No. But, but as the sun comes up, the light comes into the sky, then at least you can see, you've got visual confirmation of what may be the hazard in front of you. The problem is, in the darkness, you don't get a second chance. You don't see the gravel, and suddenly you're in the barriers or in another gravel trap. And, and so there isn't a second chance. In the, as the daylight gets better, then you can, you can see further than your lights illuminate, and that's what gives you that little break. There's your race leader, Danny Junkadea, peeled off into the pit lane. So that, in fact, is Max Hesse in third place. So Nicky Katzberg leads, but that is Augusto Farfus. So he is getting ready to take over. Uh, Danny Junkadea has peeled he has not peeled into the pit lane, no, I beg your pardon, not yet, uh, but he will in a moment or two, Marco Mappelli well, and Sara gonna... Bovi actually for the Iron Dames, the Gold Cup leader, she is in the pit lane for another regulation pit stop and here is Danny Junkadea in second place, let's ride down with him into Eau Rouge. No lift at all, just pulls another gear and continues charging on what the camera makes look like a fairly gentle slope, not a bit of it. This is a proper cardiac workout. It's a very steep hill. I've got a word that begins with H. It's called however. He lost three seconds on Nicky Katzberg, and so the gap has gone out to just wow. a whisker under nine seconds on that lap is the gap between the 98 Rover BMW, which will be coming in. We can see the driver who's about to take it over, the, the shortish figure with the Brazilian race helmet, therefore it's Augusto Farfus. But uh, this is probably the in-lap from Nicky Katzberg and most likely from Danny Junkadere as well. But he, he lost time and he's losing more time. Maybe his tyres are finally gone just as they're about to come in in the Acodis uh, ASP team Mercedes riding on board with him nobody right in front of him because the gap has gone out from four seconds to five seconds to now best part of nine seconds and the visual contact has been lost and he's not in traffic that's not where that time is going away so he is just you know when you when you set fastest race laps you ask a lot of the tyre particularly when it was early in the stint and there's a lot of fuel weight on board. And so maybe he's just asked a fraction too much and is paying the penalty for that. But Nicky Gatsberg creeping away as both these cars and probably the third place car of Max Hess and no, not the fourth place car of Maxime. You know, Maxime Martin should be in. Max Hess might not be actually this time. There's the race leader in the pit lane. And he should be followed in by Danny Junkadea in about nine seconds. Here we go, Danny Junkadea in the pit lane as well. That means that Max Hesse will take the lead for Rover Racing with the 50 BMW. Maxi Martin will pit from fourth, Maxi Book from fifth, Stein Scottors from sixth, Davide Rigon from sixth. You get the picture. Predominantly because of the way that not just the, the, the full course yellows and safety cars, but because the red flag reset everybody in terms of strategy much closer than they were, the separation that this car had of about half a stint from the rest of the field has sort of closed down to being in sync with everybody else. So the top two are in, and it triggers our latest round of major pit stops. the level of light is changing by the moment. Yes, in the pit lane, of course, there's artificial lighting from the, the lighting gantries above, but the rate of gain of light, I think we're going to have full light. Light cloud in the sky at the moment, but it's still going to be a bright morning. The Acodis ASP Mercedes stops. Of course, that's stopping in the bottom pit lane, the... Uh, not the Grand Prix pit lane, you have to go into the pit lane, up through La Source on the inside, and then down and find your pit garage. And it's towards the exit that the ASP team is based. We walk through their garage to get to the grid, the, the crowded grid ceremony, but clean the screen, most certainly you do need to do. And we're waiting now to see the Rover Racing BMW come past. That's not it coming down the pit lane. There it is at the top of the picture. So about two thirds of the way down. See, there's some flashing blue lights on the apron. That's about where the uh, ASP Mercedes is. Just passing it. Have they just right come now. out ahead? No, that's a BMW. 
No, so, I think that's the Samantha Town yeah, Racing yeah. BMW. That's uh, down towards the tail of the field, car number 28. Harry Gottsacker at the wheel of that. Out just of pit the, out. out. Off the pit speed limiter, there comes the second place car, 88, just yep. under the black gantry there, the Audi Sport gantry. Looks like nothing ventured, nothing gained. It was 8.6 seconds between first and second between, well, the car that Augusto Farfus has taken over and the car that Jules Ooh. Gugnon has taken over. I don't think there was any particular gain. Let's look at the time at a standstill. Three tenths of a second was the time between them and yeah. uh, in terms of their pit stop time. But uh, it was Augusto Farfus, when you're winning, when you're leading, you gain advantages at every opportunity. They were the ones yeah. that gained the three tenths of a second. Well, listen, again, you know, you never know where the torpedo that's going to hold you below the waterline is coming from. So when things are going well, you've just got to ride your luck and hope that it continues there. They're doing everything right. And Lady Luck appears at the moment to be smiling on the Max Hesse comes in from the lead. He is now in the pit lane. You can see that highlighted in red on the timing tower. And so Maxi Book now is the race leader, yet to stop, but should stop this lap. He's just gone by Nicky Team's Aston Martin, by the way. That's a very tight battle. So Maxi Book is currently the de facto leader with Nicky Team in second, but they should both be in within a lap or so. Maxi Book is in the pit lane now, as our erstwhile leaders are back out on track. 4.45 in the afternoon at Spa-Francorchamps, a glorious summer's day, and what's more glorious than 66 GT3 cars powering around one of the greatest circuits in the world. Brilliant start from Klaus Backler, second at the start, but by the first corner he had moved his bright green dynamic motorsport Porsche into the lead of the race from pole starter Raffaele Marcello, and importantly everyone behind, the other 64 cars in this bumper field, got around the opening lap without contact. It was seen as a miracle. By the second lap they decided two or three abreast was the way to go up the Camel Strait. The bad pad Motorsport Mercedes just at the front of that cluster. The first car to fall, well, it didn't fall, it was pushed. It was Nigel Bailly in the 107 CMR Bentley. That was dragged out of the gravel, and unfortunately, the equivalent of being dragged up to the clerk of the course, Kenny Harble, who did the pushing, he was to pick up the first of many penalties the drivers to earn to the course this race. Track limit's always a problem, and uh, unfortunately for people who went out towards the edge, sometimes coming back on caused a puncture, or it may have been contact, but Sandy Mitchell, the first driver, to pick up a puncture, and at the hour mark, suddenly we had a whole host of those. Stephen Grove off, but fortunately back onto the circuit at Blanchimont. Then how's this for tight? Maybe a shade too tight. Combe Ledegar being edged wide onto the grass. Yes, onto the grass as he tried to get past Lucas Stoltz, down past the old pits. Stoltz uh, then Managed to stay clear, but uh, giving chase and going up into second place was Raffaele Marcello as uh, Com Ledegar just lost a little bit of ground in the 54 Porsche. Plenty of racing action all the way down through the classes. Then the first car out of the race. Uh, a high, high speed spin for Cesar Gazur and a big clatter into the wall. Managed to make it back to the pit lane only for the team to say, OK, no, we're not going any further. Racing continued after that safety car incident and the first of a number getting tagged out, Jens Lieberhauser. Behind the safety car, the Sky Mercedes clattered a Porsche rival at La Source. Back to green flag racing and no change there. Jens Lieberhauser getting tagged again by somebody different this time. That car having uh, an awful lot of attention paid. Four car pileup at uh, the Piffpaff put the next safety car out and as we went green again, uh, the Mercedes running into the back of the Porsche putting both the uh, 91 car out of the race and the errant Mercedes driver. Again, uh, the race interrupted and heading back to green in excellent condition, I mean perfect conditions. A uh, little bit of over-ambition with the throttle from the Sky Mercedes seeing it spin around. Ferrari versus Porsche as the 71 car started to move up the order and the early pace set by the Mercedes uh, continued and so did the early luck set by Jens Lieberhauser this time hit by two different people as Karim OJ found somebody else's gravel down at the Jackie X curve and had a high speed off. Luckily, that car was able to continue, but it was not the end of its woes. Well, some great racing. The Mad Panda Motorsport Mercedes right in the mix there. Two, three abreast, brilliant camera shots, and you needed a wide angle lens to catch the Allied Racing Porsche. They got it all wrong down at the curve, Paul Frere. Again, that number nine, Herbert Motorsport Porsche trying to keep out of the way. But the number two, 
uh, Stoltz driven Mercedes from Get Speed Performance uh, really working very well indeed. One of the scraps of the early stages of the race was between the Porsche from KCMG, that's the one on the left of the shot, and uh, Dennis Olsen on board, and Nicholas Nielsen alongside. And then, having worked his way from 30th on the grid, having been dropped down from provisional pole position, unfortunately for KPAX Racing, just as soon as they got 0 0 1 on the windscreen, they'd taken lead of the race, a puncture. They weren't the first car to have one, but it really did hurt their chances. Beautiful evening became a clear night, but not the best for everybody. More problems for the number 10, Audi. And that was uh, Adam Atiki this time. It's never a good point on the circuit to spin, but when you're around a blind corner, that's at Le Com, and that was the number three uh, Mercedes that went round Sebastian Bow with a lucky fellow that his headlights were pointing into the eyes of those approaching just as a way of warning. But then yeah. it got, as night fell here, it got more and more busy and hectic. And uh, certainly, look, suddenly you have gaggles of cars, often after a safety car restart, two, three abreast. And again, Spa Francorchamps, you've got to pick your moment. And we've mentioned already, I'll mention again, if you went offline, there was lots of tire debris here and lots of people have been dragging gravel from the new gravel beds back onto the circuit. You can see it at that source, just a another foot to the left and all those drivers will be putting little ball bearings effectively on the track for those that were following them and then we had Albert Costa having a moment he still is at a loss as to why he put the 63 Lamborghini into the wall at the exit of Lake Com. as far as he was concerned the throttle was flat and he was out of the corner alas it wasn't the car snapped to the right and that was over and out and then over and out as well for Herbert Motorsport uh, Alfred Renauer at the wheel, just lost the car over the kerbs, exiting Blanchimont, high speed lose into the wall. And that brought out full course yellow and safety car when we were back to green flag racing. Suddenly all sorts of things went wrong. The Bentley at the side of the track, the 16 car having a big accident that brought out the red flag. Fortunately, the driver was OK. And after nearly an hour, we went back to racing still in darkness. And more problems up at Le Com. Contact. Uh, leading to yet another retirement. By this stage, the 98 BMW from Rover Racing had been in the lead for two or three hours. They picked up top points at the 12-hour mark and continue to lead the race as we return to live pictures in the early morning hours here. It is currently uh, 6 a.m. 10 hours and 45 minutes, just a fraction under. And it is Augusto Farfus that leads the race from Jules Gounon, both previous winners, with Nico Verhagen in third place in the number 50 Rover Racing BMW. So BMW, Mercedes, BMW, and Aston Martin lie fourth. The light is gathering by the moment. It seems that half an hour ago we were in full darkness. It wasn't, it was starting to get light, but it really is increasing and fairly soon we won't even need headlights. Except drivers need headlights to help them do the overtaking, let people know who's around them. So Jules Gunion, second place in this race, and it's 5.1 seconds down, but importantly, he took one and a quarter seconds out of Augusto Farfus. We saw this in the last stint that uh, on new rubber, the 88 Mercedes was capable of going very fast very soon after its pit stop. In fact, Danny Junkerdea set the fastest lap of the race and the next time around he got below 2 minutes 18 and that improved that mark. At the end of the stint, however, uh, 88 Mercedes giving chase to the 98 Rover Racing BMW that you can see flashing across your screen seemed to have used its tyres up a little bit too much. And that was when uh, the 98 car, Nicky Katzberg, on board before he changed to so Augusto Farfus was able to stretch the advantage. So it's about getting the balance across the range of that stint. And the drivers are trying to run to just below a 65-minute stint. If they go beyond that, they will get time penalties. But uh, certainly it's about making things work. Right, up at La Source recently, we've had the 163 Lamborghini going for a spin, but importantly, rejoining the race. So that one has got away. That would be Marcus Paverud, a Norwegian race. No problems at all, though, for Augusto Farfus in the lead of the race by five seconds now. That was a no further damage for them. So they, he gained only a tenth of a second in the chase. But Jules Gunion's very much got the sort of sniff sniff. He's got the smell in the air and he's really, really pushing on. But just to reiterate, in terms of the technical pit stop that uh, the front runners, well, everybody needs to make. Now we're into the second half of this 24-hour race. The front runners, that's Augusto Farfus in the 98 uh, Rover Racing. 
Uh, BMW Zhu Gunion giving chase in the 88 uh, Akaodis ASP Mercedes. Neil Verhagen in the third place. Rover Racing BMW have not done their technical pit stop. It adds about two minutes to their time. Davide Regon has. He's in sixth. And the other driver who hasn't, a Nikki team in the 95 Aston Martin, who's running fourth. And Maxi Book in the 55 Grouper M Racing BMW. So they have this sort of sword of Damocles, if you will, hanging over their heads. They know they have to have another technical stop or the technical stop. Let's see how it shakes out. But for now, it's Rover Racing leading the race. Augusto Farfus at the wheel. Rover Racing enjoying such a good race. First and third in this race with Jules Gunion, the Ocodis ASP Mercedes in between. But the driver who was the star in the 98 BMW was Nicky Katzberg, and we're joining him down in the pit lane. Nicky, obviously, we're down into the the last part of the race, the last half of the race, technical pit stop still due to take place, and you guys have chosen not to take yours yet. Yeah, it seems like it. I mean, I'm not the one making those decisions, but uh, I think we're waiting for, uh, for yellow to come, and then we can do it without losing too much time. And other than that, the car's feeling great. We spoke to Nick in the night, he said the night time seems to be the ultimate performance for you guys. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the car has been very good all race. We struggled a little bit at the start, so hopefully now when the sun comes out, we won't struggle again, but so far so good. What's going to be the contributing factors to you struggling potentially in the daylight hours? Well, some cars are just more sensitive to a higher track temp. So let's hope there's some cloud cover because it seems like with the lower track temps, we're very good. So I uh, had a very nice stint with Danny just there. So good fun. But it certainly feels a bit cooler, even than it did at three o'clock, four o'clock this morning. And there's certain teams doing rain dances at the moment. And I'm told rain could come around 10 a.m. Uh, yeah, let's hope not. I mean, you never know in Spa, it could always rain here. It always spices things up a little bit, so maybe it's a good show. But right now, we're in the lead, so I'm hoping for clean sailing back home. Thank you very much, Nicky. Right. Enjoy the rest of the race. Well, clean sailing, clear sailing, that's what everyone wants. Uh, well, one let's team hope who... no sailing, no, no, no boating. No, no boating, indeed. But uh, one, Show one... boating. Yes, indeed, that's the best sort. But one crew that just cannot get the brakes, it's uh, K-Pax Racing with the number six Lamborghini. They've led the race, they had provisional pole, it got taken away, and now apparently there's a potential brief a breach of refueling that's under investigation so we'll keep an eye on that they're down with jordan pepper on board the south african in 18th place overall they're a lap and a bit down but what we're suddenly seeing is super fast laps coming in consecutive fastest laps by a driver down in 28th position of the 50 runners still going alessio rivera number 52 ferrari he did a two minute 17.8 sorry and then a two minute 17.4 absolutely flying but way wow. way down the race order but we talked about the sweet moment martin we're sort of there in terms of lap life just saw the old uh race control tower 13 degrees it shows on the thermometer there so it is a cooler morning than it was yesterday uh it's been a cooler night than it was overnight last night as well so yeah I, I, all of these cars theoretically should be able to produce the same lap time around a lap. However, how they produce it is different. All the cars look different, they sound different, their engine configurations are different. Some engines are at the front, some are at the back, some are in the middle, and they all have different body shells, which means different aerodynamic drag and lift coefficients and all the other stuff. So they make their speed slightly differently, and as you just heard from Mickey Katzberg, the BMW team feel that they have been better as the track has cooled, and that was borne out by where they weren't early in the race, and where they weren't is where they are now, at the front. Now, this is a constant with the team. All data is monitored, all data goes in. Now, this is what the team members, rather than a tyre engineer from the tyre supplier Pirelli, and so they want to know what the track temperature is doing because the next time they're racing, that data might come in handy. It might not come in handy for race after race after race, but when you start to see the temperature rising, then you can correlate with what happened previously. And how quick is it going to be rising? And in fact, yeah. the tra track temperature is the lowest it's been right through the night we went, and it was staying in the low 18 degrees Celsius. It's 17 and a half degrees, but the temperature is going to rise very quickly, well, I not, would suggest. Well, not for a while, because with cloud cover, and there's a little bit of light cloud, and the sun's not actually beaming down on us. It has, you know, come over the horizon. 
uh, officially six minutes ago. But of course, we're in, we're in a hilly region and we're in forest, so the track temperature will continue to drop until the sun really starts to have a, a heating effect. So it might go down another two or three degrees down to sort of low teens. But then once you've got a couple of hours of bright morning sunshine on it, you're right, then it will start to rise. And it probably won't reach, even by the end of the race, the highs that we saw yesterday. No, it certainly won't. It will build through the course yeah. of the day. But the way you're looking out of the commentary box is more cloud. The way I'm looking, it's very fine weather cloud, light, fluffy, and that will burn off very quickly yeah. indeed. So, yes, yeah, certainly we've got two directions out of the window. Depends which way the cloud's moving then, doesn't it? <laughs> so whether we're going to get more clouds rather than less cloud. So current track temp, 17. Yeah, might drop to 15. Air temperature, 17. Well... Uh, on the control tower it said 15, so we'll, we'll split the difference, say it's somewhere around the mid-teens. But it, it, we'll, there will be another couple of good hours of cool track temperatures. And so until the track does raise, the BMWs have to really capitalise and just try and head for the hills. All the drivers out on the circuit setting much quicker lap times than they were even half an hour ago. Many, many drivers now in the two minute 18 sectors. And uh, that, that margin was only the top three runners for quite some while in the race. Augusto Farfus's car, the 98 Rover Racing BMW, the sister car from the number 50 crew, and that 88 Acodis ASP uh, Mercedes. However, the others are getting in on the act now. And another, another quick lap coming in from Gunnar. He's now closing down on yeah. race leader Augusto Farfus. It was five seconds, it's down to 3.2. And you're out absolutely right an hour ago only three cars were in the teens everybody was two minute 20 and above now the first well there are a couple of cars eighth and ninth Nick Tandy and Felipe Nasser who are in the 20s just but everybody else in the top 10 cars top 12 cars is in the teens 219s 218s so the fastest man of the top three is still Shulgunon, so the 88 car is now closed to within nearly three seconds of the leader, but uh, on board with the Sky Mercedes. And is this a battle for position, or is he still just trying to lap a car? Going to have to try and ascertain who is in front of him. Jonathan Kui, no, he's, it's not for position. There's no. a 37 second gap to the car in front of him, which is uh, Lorenzo Ferrari, who's been very impressive. In fact, he yeah. just set the fastest lap of the 57 cars race thus far, and that's the Windward Racing Mercedes. One of the cars that just was affected early on. So Things that, go wrong to people. They so that on board for Jonathan Hui, the car in front of him is not the car that's a, a, ahead of him on the timing pile and not a, and actually a direct class rival ahead of him but it is uh, a different car that is right in front on the road and that actually possibly helps to exaggerate the gap with Luigi Ferrari ahead clearly in clearer air having set the, the car's fastest race lap Jonathan we being held up by somebody else not able to match even his best uh, in the car never mind improve on the cars uh, previous pace so traffic does have a part to play and although we're talking about different classes there are no different categories of car they are all effectively the same car just being driven by different groups of drivers with different driver rankings and at the top in the pro class the leader of the race is still Brazil's Augusto Farfus in the 98 Rover Racing BMW Sixty-six cars started the total energy spa twenty-four hours. We've got forty-nine remaining. It's still the heart of racing. Aston Martin bringing up the rear. Charlie Eastwood at the wheel. He's finally got ahead of the number five Hout Racing Mercedes that uh, was stopped up at Le Combe after contact with the number twenty-one Ferrari. And uh, again, still thirty-six laps in the rear. But hats off because heart of racing team said, "Yeah, we had the early setbacks. They cost us a lot of time, but we're here to race." And they're back out there. They will pick up a few more positions. I'm sure of that. But the person who won to pick up a position most of all is Zhu Gunyon. He's in second place. It was five seconds, it was three seconds. It's now 2.4 seconds. The gap is coming down to the race leader, Augusto Fafas. That is a big game. Three yeah. quarters of a second. The lap before, eight tenths. The lap before that, just under half a second. So and that's you're a... absolutely right. However, the leader always gets the traffic first. So Augusto is catching this group, working his way through it. And again, just to reiterate, 
These cars are all effectively identical. The balance of performance means that they, in theory, will all produce the same speed. So overtaking even the last car in the race is never easy. We're back now in second place with Jules Gounon. And again, you can see, look, he's alongside, can't get through, going to have to try again. And every time this happens, it blunts your lap time. And, and you know, we talk about a big game being two thirds of a second over two minutes, 20 seconds of lap time. I mean, it's the tiniest percentage, but the frustration level in the driver can build very easily. And that's where maturity comes in. And though Jules is still young, in calendar terms, he's not young in GT racing terms. You know, he's a, he won this race on his debut and he's got plenty of pace, plenty of experience and an old head on young shoulders. Well, he's shaping up to put another lap on Alexander West, the 188 McLaren, but there were tight, tight moments on yep. the entrance to Blanchimont. I noticed I flinched, you flinched, Martin, in the commentary box, but uh, when two billiard balls hit, them, hit themselves, the law of <laughs> physics <laughs> takes over. But uh, again, as you said, it, what he gained on the one hand, that's Jules Gugnon, he lost on the next hand because he wasn't the first car through the traffic, lost just over a second on that lap to race leaders. Now 3.3 seconds down on Augusto Farfus. The clock keeps counting round. We've got 10 and a half hours remaining, therefore we have had 30, sorry, 12, <laughs> 13 and a half hours. I nearly, nearly got it right to start you, with, and I you panicked. Fell, you fell into my track. Live subtraction on air, never a good look. You're absolutely right. 10 and a half hours remain, and uh, another, uh, yeah, the, the final tranche of points uh, will be awarded at 24 hours because we had points given for the top nine cars at six hours and then again at the 12 hour mark uh, which was under full course yellow but uh, that meant that for the last couple of minutes going up to there the battles for position in the top six which looked like they might uh, see a point or two change hands were effectively neutralized so uh, the 98 rover racing bmw again you ride with augusto farfus that's the car that took maximum points at the 12 hour mark who got maximum points who was the leader at six hours i, I could leave you to guess but i'll tell you it was a uh, rover racing number 98 so oh, they've taken they, 24 they points it. right and that's why they were out of kilter with everybody else they had stopped early done a shorter stop having worked out that by the time they got to the six hour mark it's not having led most laps over the six hours it's who is in that photo at six, at six hours, who the top nine are, and they had engineered their way to the top of the pile. So, so far, it's been a very good point scoring race. Half points, half a full race points at six hours for them, half again. So they've already got a full race victory and there's still 12 hours worth of points to go. Another full race victory to go. Just having a quick look at, uh, oh dear, oh. That, is the, that is the 32, oh, I said their race has wow. been rotten, but Charles Viet's a Belgian driver desperate to win his home race for okay. Audi Sport Team WRT. They already had Not all the other sorts car. of problems. Is that both cars involved? That's the 46 car, the car that's uh, been driven by Valentino Rossi. Now, not with him at the wheel, that's Nico Muller. OK, but. Nico Muller was a lap down and Charles Wirtz was one position ahead of him. They were separated at the start of the last lap. The it was Wirtz ahead now. in 14th and Muller in 15th. Left front and right rear damage on two cars. I, I, I know they're both WRT cars, but is that at the end of WRT's race? I think it is. Look, chair's being packed away, hoping the car will come back. 32, that's not going anywhere. That's got a broken right rear corner, probably only has one wheel drive. But the other car, the 46 car, will be coming in. So now clear all the guests and the visitors out of the garage because this is where it's going to get real. We will go full course yellow. We will go safety car because I think this might take more than a moment or two to get out the way. Jules Gounon in the pit lane. Now then, full course yellow. What did I say people were going to have to wait for a full course yellow for, Bruce? to do Ham a sandwiches? technical stop. No, indeed. Jules Gounon, clearly the 88 car was right there. Bang, get in, get it ready. There's Valentino Rossi in the garage. 
Well, it's his car that uh, was involved yeah. in that clash. Obviously, he was not on board. It was uh, Nico Muller, a platinum-ranked driver in that. But by dint of having passed Pitt in just before that was thrown, there's a five-second gap between them, but Augusto Farf has stayed out, cannot do its technical run until next time. Here's the first Valentino Rossi. I don't believe he will ever have had to go to sleep during any race he's ever done before now. I think you've won that bet, but I didn't put any <laughs> money down on the no, table. No, I, 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 that just suddenly occurred to me. You know, you, you don't nod off. You don't pop off for a snooze in the middle. Well, sometimes the fans do, but n not often in a MotoGP race. And uh, I don't think he's ever done a race long enough to have a snooze in it up until now. So uh, a first for him. And, and everything about this is a first for him. And he's... Do you see the smile on his face? OK, the car might be out. He's having a lovely time. He's really enjoying it. And Well, he, sa he said yesterday... If fun has to be part of the equation. Yeah. Right, it, it's no yeah. fun at all in the WRT camp, his camp, but his car, the number 46 Audi, coming back in with the front left damage. And I do believe that that must... I, I have a fancy that that went up the inside and uh, took the rear out of Charvitz. Yeah. Charvitz was uh, leading across the line. However, his car is going absolutely nowhere. There it is in the track on the exit of Last Source. That's going to be hoiked onto a flatbed truck. The sister car, the 46 car with Nico Muller on board, it's is limping its way back round. And immediately WRT, there as there well. certainly there is. It's a broken that needs body, clearing. broken wheel. But with Team yeah. WRT, immediately you can see the people with the acid yellow logos yeah. on their on their. Uh, overalls in the pits. They knew they had a repair coming up and the 32 crew knew they were packing their deck chairs away. Yeah, well, they, I think they were packing the deck chairs away because that's where everybody was sitting in the 46 garage. So coming in is Nico Muller, but 32 being lifted onto a flatbed. That was never going any further. There will be some sweep up. In theory, as soon as the flatbed's out of the way, you could go back to green flag racing. I think the chances are you won't. So, Jules Gounon, the 88 Mercedes, is in. Nicky Team, the 95 Aston Martin, is in. Maxi Book, the 55 Mercedes, is in. That's done a technical stop. Lucas Stoltz, number two, has not. Oh, no, hang on, 55 has not either. So, four cars are in that have not made a technical stop. They will make one now, and so will this car, 46. Nico Muller in the pit lane after an incident in the 46 WRT Audi, which it seems, although we haven't got pictures, collected the 32 WRT Audi. So two team cars in the same incident, 32 is on the flatbed. And it was, it was at La Source, they weren't racing for Position. Yes, they were. There was they half a second between them. Position. Viet's just in front of Nico Muller, and Nico Muller has got the front end damage on his car, so I'm afraid yeah. I think it looks so. He's dived up the inside, caught the right rear of the 32 car, spun that around, and for Charles Viet's, that car has already been put onto a flatbed, but at least the 46 car has made it back to the pitch. You can see the rear suspension yeah. totally out of true from that contact, and uh, we said it was a race. Some teams were not having any luck at all, and the 32 crew must have come here with high hopes. The Audis didn't seem yeah. to be the cars to have this weekend. But, you know, with their track record, they finish races normally. You never they count gather points out. hand you over never count them out. They're, they're, they're so good. They're so professional. They're so experienced. Nico Muller stays in the car, getting wheeled back into the garage. So there will be substantial work on the front of the car. It looks as though the suspension and wheels got away unscathed. But... I'm just going to throw a number at you. Four minutes and nine seconds was the technical pit stop for Jules Gunion in the 88 yeah. Acodis ASP Mercedes. That is now done in terms of having to do it another one in the race. The 98 car has now come in. It has served its pit stop. And it's running, running into the pit lane. Here we go from the lead of the race. But will it go for a technical? Let's see what the crew are looking to do. If they come and change the wheel straight away, it will not be having a technical. Well, it, they're a, a lot later into the pit lane than Jules Gounon. So Jules was clearly right by pit in when we went full course yellow. These guys were ahead of him on the track by, you know, three seconds. They were probably passing pit in when we went full course yellow and had to come all the way around. So they now need... Uh, they will get this done before it goes to safety car. The problem is... If they get caught at the pit exit behind a red light, then suddenly 
the advantage flips completely to the 88 Mercedes team. And bear in mind, if you haven't been following every hour of this race, and we can totally forgive you, it's a 24-hour race, you do need a bit of a rest, but the 88 crew that have served that technical pit stop, it's dropped them down to third position, maybe slightly, slightly lower than that, they, they got... They lost six places early on by dint of doing their pit stop under green, and then suddenly the full course yellow. Half of their rivals in the top ten then came in and served their pit stop, and therefore the positions were changed Every, around. Everybody else now that had not done in the top ten a long stop. 74 did, 38 did previously. They haven't had a long stop this time. 47 did. So everybody, with the exception... At the moment, we're not seeing the 98 car because we're seeing Valentino Rossi getting strapped in. I don't think this is going to be a long problem. There's the brakes, and there is... Well, there's the work going on at the front. The, the real issue normally when you get a shunt like that is if it hasn't torn the suspension away, body mountings and stays that hold every... brace everything in place at 160 miles an hour are bent or snapped off or, or no longer attached. And then you, then when you're into things like uh, we've got to change the, the floor at the front or the splitter or something, then that's five minutes, then that's ten minutes, and, and then that's the end of it. There's a lot of work going on in that wheel arch, but it is done. They've done the brakes, so they have done their technical change as well. Not that they are going to be... at, at the... the um, not that the Audi's going to be an outright factor, but that's the 98 car. They've done their technical change. 50 has not. Nico Verhagen, there was a driver change, uh, and he... No, he was in before, wasn't he? No, 50 has not. So, one Rover Racing BMW has. The 98 car that was the leader. Go, go, go. Go, go, go. Down the pit lane, on the speed limiter. It's about 400 miles to pit out. That's certainly what it's going to feel like because he knows the safety car is likely to be scrambled. Right now, every car on track is doing the same speed on track as he's doing in the pit lane, and that's exactly what all their rivals did in the earlier full course yellow after the midway point of the race. So they are losing nothing now. Any time lost will be in seconds or fractions of seconds just purely because the speed of them doing their, their stop and the, doing their brake change. So it's on as even. So everybody's sort of got their technical stops out of the way, clean and unscathed, with the single exception of the 50 Rover Racing BMW. But we're not in the last hour. We've got 10 hours to go. There will be another full course yellow. They didn't try and do everything at the same time. They won't get held in the pit lane. OK, they're good. That was well managed by the team, just like it was by all their rivals earlier on. Right. right. The, fi the figure I threw at you is four minutes and nine seconds for the technical stop for the 88 Mercedes. Four minutes and four seconds, so five seconds gained by the 98 BMW crew. So advantage for Rover Racing. As Already as, had an advantage. As long as you don't go under the minimum time, because then that will be added to your next pit stop you're good to go so there is time to do it a brake change in two minutes try getting that at jiffy lube i dare you but that's exactly what these guys will be able to do on every car so full course yellow here at spa and it is nearly 6 30 so heading towards the uh, uh, 14 subtraction worked really well there even with 10 uh, as a as a denominator trying to figure out what 10 from 24 was this early in the morning uh, and we will have 14 hours down and 10 to go by the time the safety car pulls in because we I think are likely to go safety car although again now that this is the first time we've had a suspension in daylight so suddenly the marshals can see a whole lot more that needs doing on the track up. And the problem is, you can do that safely in full course yellow, you can't do that safely behind a safety car, so they're now going to start compiling notes, so the next time we go full course yellow, they'll be sent out to clear bits and pieces. 
Right, Augusto Farfus, race leader, effective race leader. Of course, the order will be slightly jiggled because of that, but when it all balances out again, he'll be in front. And the car that's running last is the one in front of him. That was delayed by 36 laps, the heart of racing team Aston Martin. What could have been for them? They've been putting in very good lap times when they've been out on the circuit, but Charlie Eastwood bringing up the rear. But, you know, we, what we've seen before, Martin, we've had cars that are lap style, but they're able to lap at exactly the same pace as the very front runners in this race, which can make things a little bit complicated when they're in the middle of a four-car battle. You have th the front three with the four, with the car 15th or 16th, the whole lap down, but it's lapping at their pace. And if you're the race leader, you get in front, you, you gain a big advantage there. But what we have seen is Rover Racing found five seconds for their, for their drivers of the 98 crew. So that is going to stand them in very good stead for the remaining 10 hours of this race. You see other things that are happening. Just gone out a shot there, you saw a flatbed coming down behind the barriers. Now, that's going back to its original starting position. Also, going past our window was the tractor sweeper brooma blower thing that goes up to La Source to clear all the muck away. So that's all going on. And it seems to take forever to do the, the sort of maximum of two laps of full course yellow before we go to safety car. But it's seven kilometers. They're doing 80 kilometers an hour. These guys are taking nearly six minutes to do a lap on the on the speed limiter. So it gives the, the race director, you know, getting on for quarter of an hour before he's now going to throw the safety car to get minor incidents cleared. Ten and a quarter hours remain of the 24 hours of Spa-Francorchamps for 2022. And it's been a seesawing battle. And uh, some drivers have had a, a quiet run. Oliver Wilkinson on the lead lap. The Jota, almost like a stealth McLaren, not just in terms of its livery, the way it's delivered its race. Rob Bell did a lot of the early running in that car. Oliver Wilkinson, now it's light, is getting his time in the car to really see where he can propel that to. And Marvin Kirchhofer... Ah, now we're being told that uh, the Jota car caused... Is that correct, Martin? Yeah, caused, we're hearing that the 38 the... car caused the... Uh, well, was responsible for the 46 car, presumably, Class. being caught out by the 32 car, stopping unexpectedly early. Um, and at La Source, you know, you're coming from... <sighs> conservatively... 140, 150 miles an hour down to a maximum apex speed of 35 miles an hour. It's a big stop. And if somebody leaps on the middle pedal with both feet at maximum retardation, a quarter of a second before you're expecting them to, you hit them. Because yeah. you are covering the ground at a rate that you can't wipe out well in, it'd be in really intriguing martin to see a replay of what went on i mean yeah. our initial intelligence was that car a that was car number 46 from team wrt hit car 32 which was car b however now we're hearing that 38 mclaren i, I would be interested to see a replay of what went on but it yeah. could, as you say it could go very wrong very quickly this is the corner where the accident happened the, the short start start fi finish straight but uh, obviously yeah. the car's got very badly damaged most notably the 32 crew that was uh, the audi crewed by uh, Kelvin van der Linde, Dries van Tor, and the driver at the wheel at the time, Charles Vitz. There it is, the dust still settling in the air. That's facing backwards on the track, and it's had a thump up the rear, and the car that hit it up the rear was uh, Nico Muller, the team, the sister car that was only half a second behind it at the start of the lap, but that got back to the pits, but number 32 over and out for their race. Unfortunate indeed. Well, the uh, EVS guys don't have uh, anything from the camera of that, but I'm guessing the camera operator heard it, turned and saw what had happened. So he is right on the scene, um, and there are obviously observers there as well. Jordan Pepper from the car that set the very fastest lap of all in Super Bowl, the K-Pax Lamborghini, was then found not exactly to comply to the... Uh, the, the form in which the car was presented for the balance of performance test at the beginning of the year, it all comes down to the airbox and the air filters. It was accepted that there was, uh, as far as is, is, is possible to judge from all the data, no discernible performance advantage, but it was not as it had been. And the rule is what you present for assessment at the beginning of the season must be what you race exactly in every detail so unfortunately for kpac the team coming over from the, the series in the us um yeah not not the best time for them they were then 
They then lost their times, had to start 30th, but they have fought their way back into contention and are, you know, desperately trying to make the best of what for them has been a, a bit of a, a, a tough job. But th that's the way of this race. That's the way of any big endurance race. Daytona, Le Mans, Spa, Nürburgring, doesn't matter. You know, any of those, Sebring, Petit Le Mans, any of those big races come with a huge slice of bad luck, which is never evenly handed around. Well, let's get down to the pit lane. Gemma Scott is at WRT. There's a very heavy atmosphere down here at the moment at WRT. Nico just gutted for everybody right now. What happened? Yeah, big time. I mean, I don't know how many circumstances can come together to end up in a situation like that, but uh, Obviously, I was running behind Charles for half of my stint, and we were just, you know, trying to go ahead and try and make up some time towards the front together. And uh, there was a, I think, from a different class, a McLaren in front of him, who suddenly stopped at the exit of turn one, and I was very close to Charles. Uh, I could not really see what it would what would actually happened with the McLaren, but apparently he stopped on the exit curb. Right. Charles had to slam on the brakes on the exit, where I was already back on throttle. And by the time, uh, you know, I saw his brake lights come on, I was already in the back of him because I was like, you know, half a meter from him anyway. So. Uh, Extremely, extremely unfortunate, extremely sorry for the team, uh, it's just, you know, <laughs> it's always bad when contact happens, even if it's another car, but when it's two cars from the same team, you know, we've been working together so well for the whole week, for the whole lead up to this race, and then ending up uh, in a situation like that is just absolutely disgusting. I don't really know what else to say. No, that's fair enough. And of course, for you guys, for the 46 there, you've had a great start to the 24. You know, you really pulled it up into fourth position. Valley's back out in the car now. What can he do? Well, I think uh, the guys actually did again a mega job as usual, you know, to, to put the car back together. We had our technical pit stop still to do, so we could use that at least to try and fix uh, most of the damage that was caused by the accident. So, you know, our race is still going. I'm just dis disgusted for the 32. They've had uh, so much bad luck all week long, and, you know, that is kind of yeah the worst ending they, they could have imagined. And let's see what we can do. I mean, we, we want to finish, we want to do well, and I think, you know, Valle deserves it. The whole team deserves a decent result even though to be at the very front will be tough now thanks very much for talking to us so thank you very much uh, for nico muller putting on a brave face there. a few things seem to have happened during that moment it's been a very long pit stop for uh, nico mensel in the number 24 a uh, car that had been leading the Porsche, that had been leading the Prime class. Now Alexander West has taken the lead in the 188 McLaren. So a long pit stop cost uh, him about three minutes. It was probably a technical pit stop that went a little bit wrong. And the car's out on the track. If you've been away, you're back. Yeah. The light is coming into the sky now uh, at quite a rate. Track temperature gradually rising, but uh, there's Valentino Rossi with the scars of the battle that he wasn't part of. He had to inherit the car from Nico Muller after contact with the sister car, number 32. Still trying to get to the foot of which the McLarens was in front of them, causing that incident, but uh, two teammates hitting each other is not the dream ticket, Martin. No, but they were running close together to try and tow each other through traffic. Two cars always work better together than one, and so... Yeah, that was the, the root of, of it all, I'm afraid. Change at the top of the leaderboard for the first time in oh, flipping hours. Davide Regon leads in the 71 Ferrari from Nico Verhagen in the 50 Rover Racing BMW. 47 Porsche, Nick Tandy, last to podium right now in 298 laps. They lie in third place. The lead is covered by 8.2 seconds. More pit stops happening. Uh, in fourth place, Felipe Nasser. In from fifth, the 51 Ferrari Miguel Molina. Augusto Farfus, still under full course yellow. 98 uh, BMW is out in sixth place ahead of Jules Gounon. Don't forget those were the top two. Uh, so all sorts of changes going on here as various teams cycle in and out of the pit lane. And is that the safety car looking to pick up the leader? Yes, it, it is. It most certainly is. So is that, that I was going to say, this is, is the moment. The if everybody can get their technical stop done during full course yellow, you do not lose ground. But if under you, safety car, if you haven't got you it done now, can. you deserve to lose ground. This full course yellow has been out for 18, 19 minutes. So it came out, in fact, now 20 minutes came out at 6.17. It is now 6.37. So that's a 20 minute two lap full course yellow. And Miguel, oh, 
Davide Rigon is being waved by because although he's shown on timing and scoring as the race leader, I don't know why. Well, timing and scoring show him as the race leader, so I don't know why he's being waved by, but Davide Rigon has been waved by the safety car. Now, the timing pylon you're looking at on your screen shows Nico Verhagen in the 50 car. Neil Verhagen. Uh, uh, sorry, himself. Neil Verhagen uh, uh, in the 50 car as the race leader. And that's probably right. I'm not quite sure why Davide Rigon I'll tell you why, because Davide Rigon, he's only two minutes into his stint behind the safety car. He did that oh. in the pit lane. So he was in the pit lane when he went past the finish line. So clocked onto the next lap. And so uh, Neil Verhagen should yeah. be leading this race. But uh, let's just wait another. Well, it's going to be about three minutes to the end of the lap. The, the safety car is stopped at the side of the track now, waiting for the leader to come round because the safety car, even the safety car, can't reverse up the track. Lighter by the moment at Spa Francorchamps. The sun has risen. Light cloud here. Track conditions dry. Track temperature even starting to rise, Martin. It didn't carry on dropping. It's nearly up to 18 degrees. Air temperature, a similar margin, 17 and a bit degrees. But full course yellow. We had an incident between two of the WRT Audis and uh, the track needed clearing up. And that gave the perfect opportunity under full course yellow period for the but the drivers who hadn't done technical long pit stops for their drivers uh, to come in and make those stops under full course yellow, so therefore losing no time. Right, class leaders, Alain Valente leading for the Hout Racing team in the Silver Cup class. That's in 12th position overall, just over a lap down. So very impressive run for the Silver Crew there. And only immediately ahead of the 99 Audi, which is second in that class, having just moved ahead of Jordan Pepper in the overall standings. But uh, Jordan Pepper, not a class rival. JB Simonau, third in that category, is a couple of spots further back. But the battle for the lead, actually, the timing screen's not quite giving us the gap yet. It says it's a lap. Not sure it's an entire lap. And also, we are still under full course yellow after 20 minutes. We are trying to go behind the safety car. Safety car is on the track, but it is waiting for the leader to catch it. And the leader, like everybody else, is doing 80 kilometers an hour. So it's, it could take another few minutes for the leader to catch the safety car. Meanwhile, let's catch up with Gemma in the pit lane and the Iron Dames team. Michelle holding it out and fighting it out really well for the girls here. Yeah, absolutely. So far, uh, I mean, we cannot complain. Still, it's a long race, which is a little bit nerve-wracking. Honestly, we would like it to finish right now. But, uh, I mean, uh, I'm really proud to see what we've been doing so far. We didn't expect it after qualifying, to be honest. But this race is so much about uh, not doing the mistakes. I mean, they can still happen. We still have 10 hours to go. But so far, everybody has done a perfect job. It has been difficult. I mean, we've seen safety car after safety car. We've had one red flag so far. Hopefully no more to come. What conditions are changing now coming into the, the morning? Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, people are getting tired. Drivers are probably getting tired as well. The teams are getting tired. It's it's actually now it's often that you see more and more mistakes happening. But of course, the level is, in this championship is extremely high. Um, but I mean, we just want to continue like we've been doing so far, not doing the mistakes, uh, driving a little bit more maybe on the safe side, and then we have to see how it ends. The smile says it all. Enjoy the next 10 hours. Thank Thanks, you. Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, they do enjoy their racing, the Iron Dames crew, Michelle Gatting there, the Danish driver, her Swiss teammate, Rahal Frey, who is the highest rated of the drivers on the uh, driver ranking scale. She is now at the wheel. And uh, usually there are three of them racing together. They've been joined this weekend by Dorian Pat, who uh, doesn't race with the, uh, with the other trio in the World Endurance Championship, but is part of the uh, European Le Mans series crew for the Iron Dame. So it's a four car driver lineup, the only all female crew, and they are leading the Gold Cup. And they are leading the Gold Cup by one lap over their closest rivals. So there is the Iron Dame's car. Uh, and, you know, they they realise that as an all, particularly an all female racing crew, they are very much 
a if you can't see it you can't be it kind of identifier for a lot of potential young female racers now they're not just in it to inspire others they're in it to win races and in this case to win their class within the race um, because they're all professional race drivers but they do really understand and the team boss really understands that they are very visible and 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 that's the whole point you know they could be in a white car or a yellow car like their other team they have gone for being very busy very visible if we're going to be um, you know, inspiring people, then we want people to see us to be inspired by well, easily. Well, Martin, we saw, we saw, we saw the, the Iron Dames crew at the Goodwood Festival of Speed, and I remember yeah. Sarah Bovey saying this little girl came and stood behind her, she's wearing her full pink overalls, and this girl just stared at her and just went, I want to be yeah. like you. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and it, it, it is, you know, so many, I mean, you know, Lewis Hamilton, why did you get, why did you want to go racing? Because I wanted to be Ayrton Senna, because Ayrton Senna inspired me, you know, Senna, Hamilton, Schumacher, all these, all these great drivers in any category will inspire others to go and try. And, and it's not just racing, it's every single sport, you know, and, and, and that's, that's all part of what they do. And they don't go racing just to inspire. Ooh, is that the 71? 51. So that is what, 61, 61 rather. car 61, okay. not 51. It's not one of the Iron Links Ferrari, so big scare if you're in the Iron, no, Iron Links. Bit. Same colour, so but that's a 61 Ferrari looping round as they build up speed to try and catch up to the safety car. That, that isn't that a 61, take, so hold no, on, it let's is just a 51 then, it. So it is the 51. There is a, that is an Iron Links Ferrari. It's Miguel Molina, factory Ferrari driver, losing it, catching the safety car. A spin under a safety car, less than ideal, not uh, approved by people in race control, it must be said. But for the 51 car, it was in the Ferrari was, it was in eighth place, and yeah. it was seventh place the lap before, the little spin being very ex expensive for them indeed. So Davide Regon leading for Iron Lynx Racing. That's the yellow Ferrari, the sister car of the white one we saw just have a little bit of a rotation. Now, we saw the safety car wave by the 71 car which turned out to be an error. Um, so when everybody was at full course yellow, uh, full course, yeah, full course yellow, uh, doing 80 kilometers an hour, having realized the mistake, race control can then get the safety car to speed up and go past these cars and then pick up the leader again. Alexander West, garage 59 McLaren, uh, car number 188, leading the Pro-Am class by... by... 13 seconds, yeah. that's all. And it's get, I would suggest that Nico Menzel, let's look at their pace when the cars are relieved behind the safety car. But for now, the Swedish racer Alexander West, he'll have a massive smile on his face. 22nd overall, but importantly, Pro-Am leader. But, with a bit of bodywork hanging off with the chasing car there, did I spot? But he's he's leading by 13 seconds before they catch the safety car. So that gap's not going to grow. In fact, it's going to disappear because where's Nico Menzel? He's probably fourth or fifth in this queue. OK, another thing I want to throw in the mix. Davide Regon, bear in mind, we had the top six cars who hadn't done their technical stop, yeah. whereas he was the lead car in seventh place of those who had done their yeah. technical stop, which adds about two minutes to your pit stop. That is why he's at the front of the race. That's no, no, no. why KCMG... The reason he's at the front of the race is their last pit stop was a one minute 20, not a two minute 20 stop. So they short fueled to get track position. OK, does that mean Nick Tandy in second place, who started stone last for KCMG? Is that Porsche then going to be the, the, the no, race? No, because they short fueled as well. Their <laughs> last stop was one minute 44. Augusto Farfus's last stop was four minutes four. So he did technical. a technical stop, but he is only 40 seconds behind. So. Halfway through the stint, Regon and Tandy are going to vanish into the pits because they'll be on bingo fuel, and Augusto Farfus will still have half a tank left. So right now, again, it's not short-term pain, long-term gain for the top two, but it might be for Farfus. Well, it may well be, but just to go back to the point I was, I was making, before we got to the technical pit stops, the first one of those, the runners who had yep. served a pit stop for in the technical one, adding two second, uh, two minutes to their time, was Davide Regon and likewise Nick Tandy as well. So they, they did those earlier on. They weren't in the top six. They were seventh and eighth at the time. However, it's all changed. Safety car round at the front of the field. It's not the first we've had. It's the tenth time we've had a full course yellow. But now, 
Let's see how the order shapes up. Safety car remains out here at Spa-Francorchamps. It's now officially Sunday because the sun is up. It's daylight. It's Sunday. There's just under 10 hours of racing still to go on this fabulous roller coaster circuit. And Davide Rigon is the leader for Ferrari, but he and the second place car only have half a tank of fuel compared to the third place machine. So the race started in beautiful sunny conditions late in the afternoon, 4.45 p.m. Central European summertime. It's been the end of a long, hot two weeks here in Belgium. Track bone dry, weather beautiful and hot, and the crowds back absolutely heaving with humanity. A fantastic sight for the drivers who've raced here behind closed doors for the last two years. Still the same number of cars and drivers, but with tumbleweed in the grandstands. This year, a very different field pre-start, and the racing was exceptionally exciting. Now, the reintroduction of gravel traps here at Spa has made a big difference. First to encounter them, the 107 Bentley, and everybody expected gravel traps to be the big story early on with safety cars and full course yellows, but in fact, the first two hours, Bruce Jones ran clear without any such problems. At the end of the first hour, we got the start of a run of punctures. They tended to perfect the Lamborghinis and the Audis, and a big, big moment for Stephen Groves, the Australian racer, went wide, very wide indeed at Blanchimont. He got it back on the track. And now this is wide and a little too wide down the start finish straight, and uh, that is Colm Ledegar, who took over the Porsche that Klaus Backler led away in at the start of the race, and then was losing ground a little bit during this stint. This is Raffaele Marcello moving up past him, and all along it was Lucas Stoltz in the number two Mercedes that was pulling clear, but of course the order kept on changing. Eddie Cheever the third really attacking very hard indeed. And unfortunately attacking too hard was Cesar Gazzo, who was the first faller in this race, the first retirement. That meant 66 cars became 65. Yeah, big incident, hit the wall and brought out the safety car, even though he made it to the pit lane. That bunched the entire field up, and so inevitably, plenty of rubbing and racing. Just a little bit overambitious with the rubbing there. Jens Lieberhauser, the man who got tagged off, the first of a number of rude assaults. That was the second, same place, same safety result. In this lap. And interesting to see, it's also when you look at the evasive action there, it was the 46, Valentino Rossi car that had to go wide in avoidance. Then Isak Tutumlu going for a spin in the Leipzig Motorsport Lamborghini. And still the attacks came. This is the ever-charging Patrick Niederhauser trying to go inside the number the 71 Ferrari. But then, unfortunately, the 777 Mercedes clattered into the back of the 91 Porsche. They were both out of the race, but still retirements were thin on the ground, which was very good news indeed. And the weather conditions, Martin, absolutely fabulous at this point in the race, so no excuse for spinning there for Sky Tempesta Racing. <laughs> but they got the Mercedes pointing in the right direction. Plenty of brave action down through Eau Rouge and up through Redion. And lots of overtaking opportunities on this track. Some of them were taken cleanly. Again, Jens Lieberhauser was the victim of a rather ham-fisted assault. Karim Oje went off on the gravel of the BMW that had gone through the corner just before him and dug the ditch on the inside. Luckily, that number 10 Audi would continue, but its problems would also continue as the race developed. Plenty of muck off the racing line. There was rubber, there was gravel, and certainly anybody running wide suddenly found themselves running even further wide. But one of the cars making a huge success of its climb up the order was the 71 Iron Lynx Racing Ferrari, the yellow one of their pair. Not everybody could stay on the track, though. Allied Racing Porsche running uh, wide, 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 and a little further wide at Curve Pool Forever, but it did get back onto the racing tarmac. And then, among the battling Mercedes, it was the 88 crew just getting ahead of the number two. Two cars that led the early stages of the race, but one of the best battles was the KCMG Porsche. There it is with the blue flashes attacking the number 51. Iron Lynx racing Ferrari, Nicholas Nielsen in the Ferrari and Dennis Olsen, the Norwegian racer, getting it sideways at the top of the hill and hanging on. Unfortunately, having just gone from 30th on the grid up to lead the race, no sooner had the six K-Pax racing Lamborghini got into the lead than poor Marco Mapelli picked up, yes, a puncture and had to limp his way back to the pits. Not their weekend, not Lamborghini's weekend, as the shadows lengthened and the sun dropped below the horizon. Not the weekend either for the number 10 Audi, once more in trouble that time with Adam Atiki, uh, almost stranded out on the circuit. Coming down the hill and seeing headlights in the dark facing you, you get that on the normal roads, it tends not to happen in a racetrack and puts the willies up the drivers. Uh, and anybody creeping in in these conditions needs to have their wits about them as well. 
One driver had a particularly narrow escape from the gravel trap of the newly renamed Jackie X curve. And the racing after yet another safety car proved just as tight in the darkness hours as it had in the daylight. When you bunch everybody together in equal cars and then let them have at it, it can lead to even more racing interruptions. Spa Francorchamps on a circuit just with such fabulous flow. Some tight quarters too, La Source being one of those, but uh, it was about precision and the 88 Mercedes ever faster at this point in the race as night had well and truly fallen and as soon as uh, Raffaele Marcello got in for his second stint and once he got into the lead of the race he pulled clear by a dozen seconds however it's uh, a race of seesawing action because people have accidents and that was Albert Costa getting it wrong on his outlap in the 63 Lamborghini he was distraught convinced he must have hit oil and totally surprised he thought the corner was behind him alas it was alongside him yeah, big incident for him, and that brought out another safety car back to green flag racing and another safety car period, uh, encouraged by the retirement of Albert Renauer after a big hit. Then we went back to green, and suddenly cars were stopping everywhere. 107 Bentley out of the side of the track, their race ended, and a big crash for the number 16 machine. Luckily, the driver was OK, but it brought out the red flag, so medical crews could attend to him. We had a red flag for nearly an hour before we went back to green flag racing. And when we did, once more with the field bunched up, the 98 Rover Racing BMW at the front of the pack. The BMW's first and third with the 88 Mercedes between them. Dropping a wheel over the curb by just a foot or so brings gravel on the track. It can flip the nose of the car around and the tail and the spin in front of others would lead to more full course yellows. However, the majority of the racing at the front end of the field, very, very clear. Indeed, of course, the night feels long, but uh, soon at five o'clock in the morning, light was coming into the sky, but not in time to save the number five Mercedes. And unfortunately for Arjun Maini, he had a contact with the 21 Ferrari driven by David Perel at the top of the hill. And it was over and out for one of those two out racing team Mercedes. At least the sister car is leading the Silver Cup at this point in the race as night turns to day. But at this point, it was also the Rover Racing BMW leading comfortably, but with the 88 Acodis ASB Mercedes giving chase. That's the story of the race, the two fastest drivers. But at six hours, it was the 98 BMW that claimed the, the most points. And at 12 hours, they had managed to engineer themselves into that position as well. The next tranche of points comes at 24 hours. Will the 88 Mercedes be in there? Well, they're certainly taking the fight. Uh, Nicky Katzberg, and Raffaele Marcello swapping fastest laps of the race uh, early in their stints at the end of the uh, night. And then the latest safety car, uh, which has just pulled in, caused by an incident between teammates. The two remaining WRT cars were running nose to tail, trying to close in on the leaders. Uh, and the first of them was caught out by a slow McLaren. And as a result, the two of them crashed a little uh, harmless but uh, embarrassing spin for the 51 Ferrari. That is the uh, Iron Lynx car of Miguel Molina that is currently in seventh place there. The race leader, 71, Davide Rigon, but he and Nick Tandy in second place uh, with uh, only half a tank of fuel to get them through this stint. You just saw Valentino Rossi, whose 46 car is back in the race, but it looks as though the other WRT machine is not. We're back, racing under green flag, and it is Davide Rigon who leads By, by three tenths of a second, Nick Tandy yeah. is right under his rear wing and catching the pair of them is Augusto Favos, so he's about two and a half seconds further back, but he is has just set the fastest first sector of anyone, that number yeah. 98 BMW coming right back to his ultimate form, but Nick Tandy's got the flavor. This is the car that started 66th, i.e. Yeah. stone last on the grid. A brilliant <laughs> opening stint from Nick Tandy, gave him here 40 something positions as he worked his way up the order. But right now, this is a driver who's won here before and he's going for a massive, massive charge to see if he can take the lead off Davide Rigon. But look in the background, not the green uh, car between them, but uh, the Rover Racing BMW, just two cars further back. It will have a little struggle to get past those cars, Get needs that traffic behind it, but first, second and third within that bunch of five cars. But Tandy on the attack for KCMG. Yeah, Tandy absolutely full of vim and vigour and determined to have a, a really big race here. And it is entirely possible as he lunges to the inside of Davide Rigon. As they go into La Source, does he get the drive on the exit? No, certainly yes, he, he does. He has the lead. Well, that was a brilliant, brilliant wow. move because uh, Davide Rigon right at the top of his game. But uh, the, the hunt was on. And now 
Let's see how much Nick Tandy can pull clear of Davide Rigon and how soon Augusto Farfus can depose those back markers and yeah. get on to the tail of that yellow Ferrari. It was leading, it's now back into second place. Still two cars between Farfus and his next target. But Davide Rigon was the leader, he is no longer. Nick Tandy pulling further clear. Uh, yeah, Nick Tandy out front and here is now the challenge for Augusto Farfus to try and get by the one, two, three cars in front of him to try and chase down the leader. And don't forget that Nick Tandy and Davide Rigon there in the yellow Ferrari had short stops. They stopped a full minute shorter in the pit lane than the BMW. And that means they've only got half a tank of fuel or they only had half a tank of fuel. They will have to stop before the BMW. So here's on board view with Davide Rigon, the replay of the pass. He's in the middle of the road doesn't really move to the racing line, trying to guard the inside and the outside. Aha, Nick Tandy having none of that. Lick the stamp, full send. Look, no, Davide Riga also realised what was happening, didn't want to pull across on him, yeah. for which we say thank you very much indeed. <laughs> but he's lost the lead. But as you say, Martin, still plenty of time, nine and three quarter hours in this race. However, the next target is on his back, and that's the target of the driver. At the back of that group, the yellow, white and black BMW, Augusto Farfus lapping very quickly indeed, faster than the two cars ahead, but he has two cars between him and the first and second cars in the race, and he's not finding it easy to pick them off. Nick Tandy on this lap, fastest second sector of the race for the KCMG Porsche that leads, and uh, a pretty decent first sector despite having to dive bomb uh, Davide Rigon for the lead. Augusto Farfus in third place is the fifth car in the queue, the yellow, white and black for Rover Racing. But right now, KCMG started last and with just under 10 hours to go, they lead the race here at Spa-Francorchamps. But 4.45 this afternoon is a long way away. So Nick Tandy, our race leader from Davide Rigon and Augusto Farfus in third place. And Tandy is clearly in take no prisoners mode. The car ahead of him looks like it's just come out of the pit lane. I'm not sure why it's weaving because nobody has just come out of the pit lane. But there again in top form is Augusto Farfus. But the two cars in front are now jammed right behind Davide Rigon because he got held up by the Porsche as well. So Farfus has got by one of them. He's got by the green Lamborghini, which I think probably left the door open a little. And there goes Nick Tandy. Look at him, he's off. He's in a different race here already. Yeah, he's just put in his car's fastest lap of the race. That's uh, six tenths off the ultimate fastest lap. But bear in mind, this car's almost never been in clear air. It's been working its way up through the order. But yeah, he is really just rocketing clear. Now, in that lap where he's just set the car's fastest race lap, he passed Davide Rigon for the lead and still went 2.1 seconds quicker on that single lap than the man who led it at the beginning, Davide Rigon, in that yellow Ferrari. He also went 1.4 seconds, 1.5 seconds quicker than Augusto Farfus. So Farfus is closer to Tandy's pace than Rigon, but Davide Rigon has that little bit of track position as we wind with him. The mirror will show him. That's the top screen there beside the one that's got his driver time, uh, stint time on it. And uh, that is the one that will show the view behind. And this is the view from the tail of the queue, or not quite the tail of the queue now, for Augusto Farfus. The question is, where is he going to be able to get by the car in front of him? Has the pace to be faster, needs to have that Audi moving out of the way. It's a lap down, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's still sitting in front of him. Nick Tandy, nearly five seconds clear. That's been amazing in the stint of one lap. He took the lead, and the next time around, he'd added another two seconds to his advantage. Two and a half seconds, if anything, over Davide Rigon. But for Augusto Farfus giving chase, well, trying to see if yeah. he's in the, in the rear view. You can see him in the, in the video there, but he's dropping back a tiny bit. 
Tandy on this lap that they've just finished, 2.9 seconds quicker than Davide Rigon in second place. I mean, Davide is clearly hanging on here, and Tandy is absolutely in feeling no pain whatsoever. Augusto Favre, so that one Audi between them. I'm not sure which one I Audi I think it's it the 99 is. car, which is the lead Audi, Alex Arco. Well, let's take okay. a look. It does appear to be dark in, in livery. I'm oh, fairly sure that's yeah. the one. The Tur Turkish German racer. See the lights flashing there. Augusto Farfus just hits the flash button and it gives them the five flashes. Get out the way, get out the way. But the team, of course, don't want Aka to lose any ground because he's chasing Valent, who's three, row, uh, three spots up the road ahead of him. And because they're behind the safety car, how, what's that in time? It's probably, well, it's probably actually quite a long while because he's right at the front of the safety car queue and his rival will be right at the back of it. So actually he's three quarters, maybe more, of a lap behind the guy that he's chasing. OK, let's throw a few more things into the mix. The driver in fourth place, Felipe Nasser, is catching Augusto Farfus, who's in third and being frustrated. We're riding on board with Farfus yep. at the moment. He's being uh, held up a little bit. But in turn, Jules Gunion in fifth place is catching the driver in fourth place, Felipe Nasser. Miguel Molina is in sixth place, just moved ahead of Ollie Wilkinson. Now, Regemma Scott down in the pits has spoken to Jota about the suggestion that, Joe, that, that Ollie Wilkinson was stationary in, at uh, La Source that caused the battle and the collision between the 46 and 32 WRT Audis. And Ollie has reported there have been some gear shifting problems, but nothing, there is nothing revealed on the data and didn't report anything at the time of the incident at La Source. Maybe some, uh, well, who knows? But what we do know for sure is that uh, Nick Tandy is pulling ever further clear. 5.4 seconds to the good this time around over Davide Regan. Regan was very gentlemanly. Once he saw he was coming up the inside, saw no point in closing the door, but also, Martin, with the gravel trap now at the source, if you're on the outside, someone's got the inside, you're the one that gets tipped into the gravel. So I think an element of maturity there, no, you can come through as long as we don't clash, and I'll tuck into second rather than sitting in the gravel trap and watching the world and his dog go by. Well, because of the gravel trap, if you've got your line wrong and you get on the gas on the wrong line, there's nowhere to run out wide at, so suddenly you might have to hit the brakes. Now, there are three potential candidates. Could be the Jota car of Ollie Wilkinson, could be uh, Alexander West in the car that's battling with uh, Nico Mensel for the lead. Could be of, Brendan Nereve. Of their category, could be Brendan Nereve. But those are the only three Mc McLarens in the race, so... Uh, it. Nico said he thought it was a McLaren from a different class. Now that that's, doesn't narrow it down very but much. If, if he doesn't know which McLaren it was, but in, he may just have, have figured, okay, it's not the Jota car, it's not our one, it's not the one we need to worry about. But um, again, you know, if a driver gets the line wrong coming out there, then the option is, if if a lift won't do it, jump on the brakes or go into the gravel trap and potentially end of your race. Um, so. Yeah, it's it's hard to know, and and possibly one of the other two McLarens will have the data that tells them it was them, but I don't suppose they'll flag anybody down to to uh, let us know. Right, fifth place uh, and fourth place could be about to swap over. Fourth place, the blue Porsche Felipe Nasa really being hunted down by Jugunio. Nick Tandy leading by 5.4 seconds at the moment. A few back markers have been in the way of the top five, but they're lapping very well indeed. Track conditions still absolutely fabulous. A lot of drivers lapping very close to their best pace so far in this race. But uh, for the driver who wants to be in the lead of the race, Augusto Farfus getting very frustrated, being tucked in behind the lapped 99 Audi of Alex Arco. That's an attempto racing example. And you can see behind the green Lamborghini, it's yeah. very busy indeed. Fourth place looking up to the tail of that fourth place Porsche from EMA Motorsport, Felipe Nazar, thinking, can I go up the inside? Can I, can I, can I? Yes, he can indeed. So the number 163 Lamborghini, uh, Mattia Michelotto keeping out of the way, and Akodis is Mercedes also getting by on the exit of Last Source. That's good. Down the drop they go to Eau Rouge, all but scraping the paint off the pit wall as they go past. But Eau Rouge feeds into Radion. The driver sees Sky and a real bounce off the curbing at the top of the hill there by Felipe Nazza. He's feeling the pressure, and the car that's on the charge is Jules Gunion. Well, you can just about say that. He's in the car, he's on the yeah. charge. That's how it works yeah, yeah, with yeah. Jules. <laughs> he doesn't have any other gears, does he, Jules Gunion? There he is, fifth place in that uh, 88 machine. And this car has been one of the stars of the race through the nighttime sessions. And again, 
working their way right back into contention. Miguel Molina is six seconds behind him. And a further five back is Ollie Wilkinson in the lead McLaren. But right now, Gilles Gonon has eyes only for Felipe Nasser's rear end. That didn't sound the way it should have done. Uh, he's desperately looking to try and find a way by. And, and actually, now that they've got by that green Lamborghini, Nasser in that blue Porsche has just been able to sort of stretch his legs away a fraction. But that's the middle sector, which works well for Porsche. The long, fast final sector might work better for Gilles Gounod. Might not. You know, each of these cars has their own little idiosyncrasies. But uh, the Mercedes certainly is as quick as the Porsche in a straight line. So. Yeah, but the sad thing for both of them is, uh, for Nasser and for Gounod, is Augusto Farfus was able to, having got ahead of that group of cars, to, to pull clear. He's another four seconds up the track in yeah. third place overall. 1.3 seconds down on second place, David Rigon, who's 5.3 seconds down on Nick Tandy, lapping at the same pace as the race leads, but he made that break. He got the passing yeah. manoeuvre and in two laps built four, just under five second advantage. And that was the luck coming the way of the car that started, I'm going to say it again, and I'll say it again and again, started stone last. Yeah. 66th position and KCMG leading this race <laughs> with their Porsche. A, a great quote before the start of Le Mans from Jota's Antonio Felix da Costa. He said, we're fourth on the grid. I've got 24 hours to pass three cars. <laughs> Tandy had 24 hours to pass 65 cars, and there are still nine and a half hours remaining. So by by 10 of the 24 hours, 14 of the 24 hours, he passed 65 cars. Yeah, he overachieved not, not in the on opening his own, stint. But yeah, now a real yeah. challenge coming down the hill towards Eau Rouge. You've got the Mercedes in fifth place, or is it still in fifth place? Yes, it is. We're riding on board with Jules Gunion all over the curves. Felipe Nasser will have no fillings left in his teeth. Not that he had any, I'm sure. <laughs> over the curbing at Radio, really bad. Bouncing around here we go, in that here blue we go, Porsche. Here we go. Is he going to get an overlap? No, he's not. So, Jules flashing the headlights. And Miguel Molina still safely behind. He doesn't have to worry about the cars behind attacking him for a position. What he doesn't want is to have an abortive attempt to get by Felipe Massa, lose ground, and then have the back marker that took them 10 laps to get by come back past him. That really, really would not help his humour at all. I think right now he's probably in a very happy Jules Gounon place, doing what he likes best in a car that is responding well still and attacking hard. So Felipe Nasser under real pressure for fourth place from that silver-grey 88 Mercedes. Yeah, well, NASA has only, is only 28 minutes into his stint, and Jules Gunion, who looks so like he's got more life in his tyres, ironically, has done another 21 minutes longer on this stint. But what's happening on this lap? Augusto Farfus in third place overall, who just put in the fastest first sector of anybody at any point in the race so far. He's one and two thirds seconds down on the driver in second place. That's Davide Rigon, who earlier in this stint, about 10 minutes ago, we thought his tyres were starting to go off, but he's really got them back into the sweet spot. He's not shedding too much time to race leader Tandy. It's five and a half seconds it hasn't really gone out at all but it's funny how through the course of a stint martin drivers sort of get onto the pace and then maybe they push too hard and they suffer a little bit maybe their tires come back but right now augusto farfus is getting his tires just where he wants and this car working so much better in the cooler temperatures the rover racing bmw and uh, just trying to find a position out on the track where he can make another move he's got to get past that Audi to get onto the tail of the Ferrari, but there is nothing he can do about it at the moment. Top speed on that lap for Augusto Farfus, I think. Well, it's definitely the fastest of that car, 271 kilometers an hour. And that is in old money. Oh, I've just deleted it. <laughs> <laughs> 271 times 0.62, give or take 168 miles an hour. So that's a pretty epic top speed. And yes, fastest race lap for that car, 218.0. Fastest first sector of all. And it has been the BMW that was quickest before in sector one as well. Alessio Rivera faster in sector two and three. He still has the fastest race lap from 25 laps ago, but I think that might be falling. Augusto Farfus has got the bit between his teeth. 
and is real attack mode. And he needs to be because when Nick Tandy and David Rigon have to die for the pits before he does, then he needs to have made as much of an inroad into their lead as possible. Yeah, just very aware at this point. Is that I think Nick Tandy knew when he wanted to really push his tyres. He pushed them very hard quite early in the stint to get ahead of the Ferrari of Davide Rigo. Now it's stabilised, and in fact, if anything, he's now starting to lap more slowly than the two cars behind. But yeah. he got that five. He got track position, and he got a five-second cushion. It might come down by a little bit, but it was a real case of understanding the circuit, the temperature, the the tyres, how they reacted to the KCMG Porsche and uh, doing the job of a professional racing driver, a driver who's won here before, also won a bit of a big French race yep. uh, a handful of years ago. That's Nick Tandy, winner at the Moor and here as well. And he's uh, looking very good indeed for KCMG with their Porsche, car number 47, leading by five seconds. Winner of Real Le Mans, winner of Virtual Le Mans as well. So he's had plenty of experience in endurance racing in the real world and, and in the And we've virtual. had the change. We've got we uh, Gunnar got past Felipe Nasa in the background there. And so the Mercedes was the hunter. He hasn't turned into the hunted. He will be pulling away now in fourth place. We saw how Felipe Nasa was uh, really starting to struggle, particularly through some of the faster corners. And at the heart of racing, Aston Martin in the background behind, but don't worry, that's many laps down, but it's still going, which is very good news. Let's take a look at how it happened down the bottom of the hill, just running wide oh. at the curb, Paul Fred. What do you mean, just running wide? His highs will be out on stalks. That was the opportunity, probably because of the pressure being exerted by Jules Gugnot, up to Blanchimont, around the outside at Blanchimont still. It makes me slightly sweat at the thought of saying such, such phrases, but a bold move, and Jules Gugnot didn't expect to have a second opportunity. Here it came, riding on board with the Mercedes, just dipping the wheel going through there and oh, you get so frustrated for Felipe Nasa but Jugunio he put the pressure on that caused that happen yeah absolutely and uh, Felipe just drifting out wide over the curbs Nick Tandy the race leader and he still has the lead uh, 71 Davide Rigon being investigated for speed under full course yellow so that car currently in second place and should be in about 15 minutes earlier than uh, Augusto Favre's in third place, as should Nick Tandy. There is the 71 car. So five and a bit seconds has become 4.6 seconds. So the lead is coming down. But Davide Rigon, we just mentioned that, car number 71 under investigation for speeding under the full course yellow yeah. period. That yeah. could be quite a chunky penalty. That could drop it out of the top six, I would reckon, if that's, it gets anything more than a few seconds. That's quite embarrassing, actually, because that car's being investigated for speeding under full course yellow. Sister 51 car for a spin. spun behind this, or trying to catch the safety car. So, yeah, not, not their finest hour, which is a real shame because Iron Lynx have put together a very strong challenge. This is a still a relatively young team, very ambitious. They've got the all-female crew car leading their Gold Cup. They have got two cars in the top half dozen, and they have got a very good shot at, at getting at least one of them on the podium. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the driving talent, nothing wrong with the engineering, nothing wrong with the car prep. They are very good at what they do. But there is Augusto Farfus. You can see the yellow Ferrari, and that set of headlights there is the second, uh, third placed BMW. So that's the battle for second spot. The gap, 2.5 seconds. There's the 88 car of Shulgun on for the 6.8 back. And then we're looking for Felipe Nasser. He's gone through Miguel Molina, 51. That'll be the white Ferrari. Uh, he is, well, he's gone through as well. And so is Ollie Wilkinson. Nicky team in the Aston. There he goes down the inside of that uh, green Lamborghini. And Lucas Stoltz just marker. coming into ninth place there, number yeah. two Mercedes. And the next car should be Neil Verhagen. Don't forget that number 50 BMW who've been running far higher, been running in third position. It'll be coming across the line in 10th place. Now, I noticed Jules Gugnon's turned his headlights off. He's taking a stealth approach to hunting down <laughs> uh, Augusto Farfus. They both have potential to be very quick 
indeed. But Saving there's a power. Six. He is indeed. <laughs> so he can get the air con on. The it's air worth, temperature's it's starting worth to rise. It's a quarter of a horsepower, probably. Uh, and who knows? It might be worth it in the end. It's like that thing where you've got a really underpowered rental car on holiday and, and you use the uh, turning the air, air con off as an overtaking push to pass button. Right. It so you up the old horsepower. Yeah, well, exactly. Even if it's something in your mind that you gain that performance back. Right. The team manager of car 71, the car in second place, Davide Rigon, a two uh, race contributor the stewards re immediately regarding the full course yellow now a little battle it might be outside the top 10 it's down in 15th position marvin deans in the top sport wrt porsche with uh, giacomo alto who was running very well he was running with the pace of the leaders but was a lap down he's tucked in behind in the number 19 lamborghini looking very keen indeed and as the cameras pan through some of the corners look at the amount of gravel areas we just saw that as as they exited uh the sequence at the top of the hill at Le Comp. and again Gravel just sort of narrowing the racetrack. And okay, uh, you just saw a Giacomo Alto there cut the corner on the inside, throw up a whole load of dust in the air. Some of that will be small little bits of stone as well. And everything just helps to degrade the condition of the track, certainly compared to how clean it was before the race started late yesterday afternoon. You can just see in front of them Rahul Frey. She is in the uh, pink Porsche, uh, pink Ferrari rather, the uh, Iron Dames car. Very little change in the top positions. It's uh, gone from 4.8 seconds to 5 seconds flat. That's Nick Tandy's advantage, leading the race in the KCMG Porsche and Davide Riga, Augusto Farfas. You know, they're swapping tenths of a second here or there. But those first three sitting on a tidy advantage over Jugunio, another 6.8 seconds. He will try and give chase, but he's getting, you know, they're getting on through the stint of their, their, their latest stint, and Jugunio will have to be in within seven minutes. And those behind, those in front of him, Augusto Fafas will be able to do another two laps before he comes in for his next pit stop. Yeah. So it's going to chop and it's going to change, but it's Nick Tandy leading the race, looking pretty effortless with a five-second advantage. The KCMG Porter, there it goes. Blue, white and black, their colours for a very long time since Paul Lips founded that team, uh, the man from Hong Kong. Now then, uh, on drive time, Fafas and Gunon need to come in and Tandy and Regon don't because Nick Tandy's been in the car for 37 minutes and change and Davide Regon 43 and change, but they both had shorter stops, which means they can't have as much fuel in. So we know that Farfus and Gunon need to come in because the maximum you're allowed to drive without a stop is 65 minutes and they are, well, 53 minutes for Augusto Farfus, 58 minutes in the car so far for Shul Gunon. So Gunon needs to stop within the next seven minutes, so two laps. But how much fuel have Tandy and Regon got on board? Because they short fueled compared to their rivals. Now, that suggests to me that they can't go the full 65 minutes, either that or Somebody's playing Miracle Worker. I don't know how that works. Uh, so the team manager to car of Car 71, uh, as we said, has been asked to report to the stewards. So it, that will be to hand him the penalty in note in person. That's not just for a chat and a cup of tea and would you like a bacon sandwich? What with it being breakfast time and all? Oh, that's torn it now. I've got I a new know. image in my mind. No, no, I, Either I the cup that. of tea or the bacon sandwich. You're I, a very I, cruel co-commentator, Martin. Yeah, I know. It's because that's all I'm focused on now. It's a cup of tea and a bacon sandwich. Not that we're going to be able to get either of them in the heart of Belgium, but we might get free some mayonnaise, so who knows. 98, there is Augusto Farfus. There you can see the yellow Ferrari of Davide Rigon. That's what a 2.7 second gap looks like. In fact, that seems to be opening up. Farfus got quite badly held up at the apex there at La Source. And so as he crests the rise at the top of Radion and comes into view on the Kemmel Strait, the gap has gone out a little bit, but the BMW, you can see the higher roof line of the Roa Racing BMW. And uh, oh, he's working hard to get by this Ferrari, that uh, this uh, Audi rather, that's not helping. It's really, really unfortunate. He's been blocked by it for about 10 laps now. He picked off the green Lamborghini, that was out of the way, and the Audi running over the curbs in front of him. It's a lap down. However, you've got to make your way past, and it's not being made easy for him at all. Cuts across his nose again, so it's really tricky. In fact, I think it's Dennis Marshall who's two laps down, if that's the 66 attempt to car. You know, this is 
a bit of a problem. And if race control won't, then the Rover Racing team need to trot on down the road and say, you're two laps behind, you are potentially affecting the outcome of the race. Stop being a pain and just let us go by. Yes, I thought it was the sister car that was a lap down. That's Alex Zarka, but he's not in the same position on the track. So he's running in 14th, running second in the Silver Cup class, which is still being led by the number four Mercedes. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, Dennis Marshall could lap at the same pace pretty much as Augusto Farfas. But, you know, the sweet life of those tyres, the Pirellis on Augusto's BMW has now gone away. He's getting towards the end of his stint. He can only do a maximum yeah. of another nine minutes and less, to be honest, in that Rover Racing BMW. Is he going to work his way back to the front? But with every lap, Nick Tandy chalks another one up. 315 laps on the board. 4.7 seconds to good over to Davide Regon. But bear in mind, Davide and that 71 Ferrari has this problem hanging over his head. The team manager of his car to the stewards for immediately... For, for, over, for regarding the full course yellow procedure and that of course you have a minimum speed uh, sorry a maximum speed you can do it's only 80 kilometers an hour it feels like walking pace and any transgression will lead to a time penalty for him so uh, fingers crossed for the iron links cut crew but you do feel this is uh, going to spike their gun somewhat yeah and and the, the speed differential is enormous if you have to get onto that you know, pit lane speed limiter for a, for a full course yellow. From, from an average speed of, for a lap, 135, 140 kilometers an hour, to then maintain a steady 80, must feel like you just hit a brick wall. Oh, oh absolutely, absolutely, totally. Now, Lucas Stoltz, who was star early in the race, that number two get, get speed AMG Mercedes, and he's fastest wow. and in a straight line, 274 kph. Yes, it's only one mile an hour. Another Mercedes is the second fastest. That was from the Gold Cup. That's Arjun Maini's car from the Hout Racing Team. And Rob Bell showing the McLaren. It's always good in a straight line. He is equal second. And Lawrence Van Toor in the car that's not doing too bad in the race. This is number 747 Porsche from KCMG. It's the race leader. Yep. And in fact, the last lap was very good because uh, the race leader gained just over a second from Davide Rigo, nearly six seconds to good. It'd be going the opposite direction. There but is Lucas Stoltz in the number two uh, Mercedes, and he is chasing Nicky Team. Now, Team is just two cars ahead of him on the track, and that is the bright black and yellow Aston Martin. As we get back to... Uh, there's 51, Miguel Molina. He's just gone by Felipe Nasser. Nasser dropping like a stone in that blue Porsche. He's now falling into the clutches of Ollie Wilkinson. And there is the Aston Martin. That's Nicky Team. That is the top Aston. Uh, in fact, that is basically the Aston, apart from Charlie Eastwood, who's circulating in the last spot. So that is the healthy Dane train car. Mm, it's been in the top three, but they don't believe they've got the pace to actually race in the top three. So they're hoping that Lady Luck has a little bit of a smile on them. The red car in front is not for position, but Ollie Wilkinson, the car in front of that, is. Well, just interesting. Look at the front of that. The way that Felipe Nass has dropped back down from third to fourth to fifth to sixth. We, I commented about five laps ago, it looked really uncomfortable with uh, yeah. Jules Gugnon chasing it down and uh, Gugnon's car now into pit lane. Of course, it has to come into the Formula One pits, go the whole way past all the garages there, turn right on the inner loop inside La Source and then run halfway down the old pit lane, which is halfway down towards Eau Rouge before coming to a stop. And it's come in with uh, just enough time on the clock. It's not going to exceed the 65 minutes. It exceeds ah. 64 minutes indeed, Nicky but still team. driving around to its pit. Nicky team is in with 63 minutes on his drive time. Lucas Stoltz follows him with 62 minutes and 45 out of the maximum permitted 65 minutes. So uh, the uh, Mercedes team, uh, the Akodis ASP team of Gilles Gounon didn't run it quite as far. They could have gone another lap on driver time. Whether they could have done on fuel or not is a moot point. Um, Rahul Frey in the pits as well, leading the Gold Cup. That's 19th place overall for the Iron Dames, just ahead of Valentino Rossi in the 46 WRT car. 
And for Valentino, finishing the Spa 24 hours on his first attempt will be what he's looking for. Finishing the race and having a lot of fun in doing so. Maximum possible fun, which has sort of always been Valentino's calling card, hasn't it? Whether he was in Spanish 125 all those years ago when he was 14 or 15, or whether he was racing in his final season in MotoGP, he always seemed to make it more fun than you thought might be normal. Um, and, and that's kind of what he's brought here as well. Results coming down from the race stewards. Drive through penalty for car 71. Wow. That's the car second place in the race. Davide Regon, his Iron Lynx Ferrari, transgressing into the full course yellow period. All the work becomes unraveled when you have a drive through penalty. This is not a short pit lane. It's about as long as they can possibly get. It's the two pit lanes together with a, a loop in between them. So not going to be served this time around for uh, Davide Regon, but that will promote Augusto Farfus up into second place. Zhugunion up to third. Mig well, Molina and the sister Iron Lynx Ferrari up to fourth and so on. So what a cruel thing with uh, nine and a quarter hours and a few more minutes thrown in for good luck for this pro standard Ferrari. Um, a tweet from Thies Barendrecht saying he's starting to feel a few drops of rain at the bus stop. Not a lot, but a few drops of rain. I, the forecast is not for rain, 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 go away. Uh, Drive through and... penalty to car 71. Did not respect the full course yellow speed. And and that is as as you pointed out, as severe a penalty as you get here, apart from maybe a stop and go. Uh, we have not had a drive-through yet. All the other incidents have been time added to pit stops. Um, I don't think we've had another drive-through, have we? For course, oh, did we, have we had a couple for causing incidents yesterday. I'm just I, think trying to I think we I think possibly we did. did. They yeah. ring, ring a slight bell, but not yeah. loud enough for me to hear it. I think yeah. we could say. So no, Nick Tandy did. leading the race by bang on seven seconds from Davide Regon, but the 71 Ferrari that with Regon on board will have to come in fairly soon for a drive-through penalty, and that will drop it right out to the tail of the top ten, and that will put Augusto Farfus up into second place with that ominous Rover Racing BMW that seems to get mm. better and better as. The stint keeps on a running. Flurry of pit stoppers now. Ollie Wilkinson in yeah. from sixth place overall, and uh, well, that's the number 30 Audi JB still Simonauer. going for WRT. Yeah, and, uh, been a good run from Jean Baptiste Simonau, yeah. young French driver in the Silver Cup class. Yeah, running in fact second in class now, aren't they? Because yeah. with the decline of others at the front of them, they have fallen back down. Yeah, no, JB Simonau having a, a very good run, and it, it, it's only the number four helped car that is some way ahead. That's the car that had that flappy left rear fender. So he's had the tiniest of nudges from somebody, hasn't done much in the way of damage, and in fact, it seems to have flapped a bit off, doesn't it? Tires done, fuel done, and away we go. That's how it's done, and that is them turning the corner and heading down the endurance pit road. Rob Bellion as well in the McLaren, car number 38. Uh, Nico Menzelin in his car as well. That is a class leader ahead of Alexander West. So Rahel Fry in and out. She stays in the car. Is that a triple for Rahel Fry? But she's keen. She's very keen. Right. I think that might Rover be. Rover Racing 98 BMW in, just as predicted, right on the last lap. It could have made that pit stop. It's still listed yeah. as third position, but when the 71 Ferrari serves its drive through penalty sometime soon, of course, that BMW goes up into second place overall. This is the car that took the first haul of maximum points. That's 12 points after six hours, 12 points as well by leading again when we got to the halfway point in this race. And if it could be in the lead at the end of the 24 hours, it will pick up 25 points. That would be the maximum haul you can get through this race. Well, even if cruel fate intervenes and they retire now, they will only lose one point potentially to any championship rival because the maximum available from now is 25, and they've already earned 24. Yeah, but if, if someone else had come, been second and second, they would have had nine points and, and nine that's points. that's true. That is true. I see where you were going, but I've brought you back from the brink, yes. I think, for once. Yeah, no, you allowed me to say it first. I did, I, I my, did. My bear of little brain is, uh, yeah, they could, they could lo lose 19 points. Um, Augusto Farfus in the pit lane. And so how long will it be before Nick Tandy stops? He's got... Uh, He's got 15, 15 minutes, minutes, but he's not got fuel for 15 minutes because he, his last stop was 25 seconds shorter than it needed to be. He did a short stop, same as Regon. That's how they got track position. 
and he was absolutely flying uh, when he started the stint, which also seems to indicate that he may not have had the fullest of tanks. Here's the Rover Racing BMW. It's so long the, uh, in the pit lane, isn't yeah, it? You, yeah. you run the top pitch, you've got to go around that very tight right hand.